Podtacular 415 Orbital Drop Shock Titan from March 20th, 2014. everyone, welcome to Podtacular, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast. I am your host, The Storm, and this week we are having a special podcast for you guys. We're going to be doing a Titanfall Halo discussion, kind of kicking off our Halo 5 series of podcasts, and I thought this would be a good one to kind of go over with the recent release of Titanfall and some of the things that we can take from Titanfall and how we can apply it to Halo and some of the other stuff that we can look forward to in our next Halo experience. But I have some guests tonight to help me talk about Titanfall. Uh, Brent's not here because we have a mic issue with his new computer. Uh, Godzilla sent him another one to replace the laptop that was going uh, on the fritz. So he will be joining us next week. But to help me this this evening, we have a Polish-Korean joining us. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to have you. I believe this is your first time on, is that right? Yep. Yeah, so we're going to have a, a brief intro with you, but we have a returning guest who's been on the show before. Uh, he is Justin Bryce from the Drunken Halo podcast. Hello. Hello. Welcome back. Uh, it's good to be back. Glad to see that we didn't keep, keep you away for too long. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, the last time I was on was about a year ago, I guess, maybe. It was around the E3 stuff. That was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But we have some good stuff to talk about tonight. I have a list of things I want to address with Titanfall. And we have the latest Waypoint Bulletin, in which case our beloved community manager, BS Angel, is moving up in the world at 343, taking place by Bravo. But we have some uh, other little interesting tidbits of information to kind of fill in that as well. But to start off, since APK is the, this is your first time on the show, why don't you give us a little information about yourself, who you are, where you live on the Halo Net, what you do, and all that snazzy stuff. All right. Well, I'm a Polish-Korean, better known as just APK. Uh, I have a YouTube channel mainly focused around console first-person shooters, uh, currently covering things like Halo 5, Halo 2 Anniversary, and of course Titanfall, now that that's released. Um, I've been doing youtube for about a year now and i have somewhere around i think it's like 6500 subscribers so i'm doing i'm doing pretty good um a lot better than i ever thought i would um yeah that's great man yeah that's impressive <laughs> thanks so as far as the halo stuff goes um how did you get involved with halo what's kind of your knack when it comes to the halo communities as a whole uh i'd say i found uh kind of my place uh, first with Forge. Uh, I used to be a huge uh, part of the MLG Forge forum, and I uh, participated in a lot of the offerings they had, whether it was uh, Forge contests or like Forge testing. Uh, I was a big community member there, tried to help out as many people as I could, especially during the uh, Halo Reach days. That's really when I started to uh, participate instead of just uh, being a lurker. Uh, but I have been following Forge uh, ever since Halo 3 with the uh, Heroic Map Pack when Foundry was uh, the first canvas, the first Forge canvas. But uh, even before that, I started playing Halo uh, around Halo 2. I had some experience with uh, Halo 1 just playing at friend's house, but I got my 360, I believe, when I was... Wow, how long ago was that? That was maybe eight years ago, nine years ago. And Halo 2 was the first game I got, and then ever since then, I've been a huge Halo fan. Um, there's not a single game I've put more hours into. I think that would go for all of us here, to be perfectly yeah. honest. <laughs> um, I came in at Halo 3. Nice. So did uh, I. I came in from on the console scene at Halo 3. I started off with Halo, um, Halo 1 and Halo 2, kind of with friends who had Xboxes, but mm -hmm. having my own Halo games, like for that I purchased myself. I started off with Halo CE on the PC, and then I dove into the Xbox scene uh, January 2008 when I actually bought myself my own 360 for Christmas. 
Oh, Merry wow. Christmas. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I got some money for Christmas, and I'm like, I'm buying myself an Xbox and getting Halo. <laughs> <laughs> it's, what, it's what Santa has always wanted. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah, you know, I, I have to be perfectly honest. I have never played, like, legit Halo 2 over Xbox Live. I've done the, uh, uh, what is the uh, Xbox Connect mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Ser- service. Yeah, I've done that. Uh, I actually did that, again, fairly recently. And it's still a lot of fun, but I can't imagine it's anything like it was back when it was actually active that makes any sense like the most of the games that i couldn't get in were like me and two other guys Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know it's definitely kind of one of those fond memories that you have the first time you start halo oh yeah so and and we all have a story we all come from different parts of the the franchise and starting at different points which is kind of one of the cool things that makes the halo community really awesome because you have these kind of legacy people that really started in the early days of Halo and you kind of have this mid tier that started around Halo 3 when Halo 3 was at its prime its biggest moments and then you kind of have some of the more recent Halo players that really adopted Halo Reach and Halo 4. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, I mean and you know not only that you have so many things that like you know to say you're a, like a, a Halo fan or whatever is I mean that's so such a broad uh Label. Yeah, it covers a lot of people, a lot yeah, of different exactly. audiences. Yeah, it definitely does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I was uh, a little uh, not surprised. I don't know. I can't find the right word. But whenever you said that you were, uh, were working on maps for MLG, mm-hmm. uh, that just got me thinking. Like, do any MLG guys like ever really uh, make maps, or is that like a uh, a subset of the foragers that kind of uh, cater to the more uh, competitive type stuff. Yeah, it was it was kind of like a community within a community. Like it, we were basically a sub forum of a forum, which was basically just one part of the entire Halo community. So yeah, we were pretty a pretty niche uh, group of Halo players. That's yeah. cool. It's yeah. it's really interesting the whole dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um. But I kind of want to get back on topic here because we have a lot to discuss between Titanfall and Halo. Um, Sorry. No, it, it's cool. <laughs> it's all good discussions. Uh, but we have some uh, interesting stuff. And I, I want to go ahead and get through some of the Waypoint news because I have a feeling the Titanfall discussions are going to kind of go a little crazy, which is good. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's it's a bad thing that we're going to go all out. But there's a lot of good comparisons that we can take between Titanfall and Halo. And I don't want to get in the way of that too much. So let's go ahead and look at some of the Waypoint stuff that we have in in this week's bulletin. Uh, like I mentioned before, B.S. Angel, or Jessica Shea, as some people know her, has moved up in the realm of 343 Industries. She has, quote, unquote, graduated or... I've seen somewhere online where it's she's evolved using a Pokemon reference or regenerated <laughs> uh, into the Studio Operations PM, Studio Operations Program Manager. So not exactly sure what that entails yet, but it's probably going to have something to do with how uh, things around the studio go on from day-to-day basis, getting things kind of coordinated throughout the individual teams that are there. That's kind of what my initial thoughts are from just the description of the job title. So uh, what do you guys think? What what do you think that B.S. Angel is kind of moving into now with this new position? Um, You know, I have to be honest. I've never had any uh, contact with her. Um, so I know that she was uh, the community manager. But, um, uh, I mean, I guess that's – it's uh, – it's nice to see someone who was involved uh, with 343 moving up, um, you know. Uh, so is I know that you said that you uh, didn't really know for sure exactly what that position meant. Do we know if it's a uh, Microsoft position or is it still like Xbox? It's still a 343. Yeah, okay. it's still at 343. She's not, yep. she's not moving out of the studio. Okay. But the whole studio operations PM is it's a l- it's little bit broad. odd of a yeah. description, yeah. yeah. Because she seems she seems really 
like I don't know how to say it, like wired for community related things. So I'm not sure if that position still does a lot with community interaction, but that's one of her, I mean, that is her strength. That's like her shining strength. Um, but I'd imagine she'd still like have some kind of involvement with community related interaction between the studio and obviously the Halo community. But I'm not too sure because like, like we said, that title's kind of ambiguous and broad. Well, the the thing that I get from studio operations is kind of the day-to-day interactions between a lot of different kind of teams within the studio. Mm-hmm. So she she has a knack for really orchestrating and organizing uh, big kind of things. It's one of the reasons why she was a, a great community manager. She was yep. able to coordinate all that. And this is kind of, a, I think, a move up in that direction for her. Definitely. And then so, with that move, um, I'm probably jumping ahead, Bravo – takes the community manager manager spot and then I believe was Tashi brought on the, the to then take Bravo's spot? I'm not sure how the positions underneath the community manager are kind of being filtered out. Mm-hmm. Um I haven't heard much detail on that, just kind of what was going on with Jess and Bravo over gotcha. the last twenty four hours. So um, it's possible that he's kind of there as an underling, but I thought he was wasn't exactly brought on board for the community management team specifically, mm-hmm. at least from yeah, what I heard. Sure. Yeah. But all in all, great movements for both of those guys. We congratulate them and, and wish them the best of luck in their new positions. Um, we have a pretty big expose from BS Angel. She kind of got her one last word in the bulletin, but I have a feeling we'll see her uh, creep in every once in a while. Mm-hmm. At least it'd be nice to Jess. Just don't go away for us too long, will you? Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> if you want to read that, it's it's all there. It's a good like four or five scrolls all the way through. Um, but there's some pretty interesting stuff in there from when she started on with three four three and to where she is now. Um, some pretty cool stuff in here. Uh, apparently, when uh, at Co- uh, Emerald City Comic Con 2011, she actually showed off Halo Reach to Norman Reedus, which, um, for those of you who aren't very good with associating movie star names with actual on-character names, uh, he is one of the people that was one of the brothers in Boondock Saints and one of the brothers in The Walking Dead. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So apparently she showed him how to play Halo Reach and (laughs) showed it when they were showing it off at Emerald City Comic Con in 2011. So that was pretty cool. Yep, that's really cool. Yeah, uh, it, I'd like to show him how to play Halo someday. That'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to make it out to Emerald City Comic Con at least one of these days, but my big conventions right now are PAX and RTX. So maybe maybe someday. But yep. um, next kind of milestone that she has put in her little uh, expose is the VGAs. She was actually doing the red carpet uh, during the 2010 VGAs which is uh, pretty cool being hired onto the studio very early on and just getting that kind of exposure is pretty cool being, uh, being on camera for something like that. For sure. You mean uh, she repres- like was one of the people representing three, four, three. No, no, no. She was actually on the red carpet doing interviews. Yeah. Oh. She, yeah. yeah. She wasn't showing off Halo or anything, but um, during, cause let's see, that would have been, yeah, that would have been the last year we would have seen Halo win something. I believe Marty won the um, award for best game music during that. For, for, Reach. for Halo Reach. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So kind of appropriate year for that as well. And it's another little milestone to kind of put chalk up on the chalkboard for BS Angels. So she's making her rounds. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, next things that she has listed here is the, the Xbox One commercial with... Um, J.J. Abrams, Bill Gates, Steven Spielberg, and all those uh, big names out there. Uh, this was the one that they showed off. Uh, I believe it was right after the Xbox One um, was it streaming event back in March of last year? Oh uh, yeah, or the May uh, of last Spring year. Showcase. Yeah, the Spring Showcase. That was it. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was the one that they showed off during that. This is a pretty cool video, and yeah. she has some, some pretty cool lines in there. Um, I don't know how many people can say they were in a video with even just one of those individuals, but with all of those individuals, that's that's crazy. Yeah, that's that's a big yeah. big thing. I've got to be honest; I didn't, I don't remember that. 
But really? it sounds really cool. Again, go watch I it. wish I could do that someday. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, just maybe. <laughs> Speaking of which, we need some information on the, the Halo TV thing, which would be nice oh, God, at some yes. point. Uh, bravo, if you're listening now. Now, yeah, now it's, it's now it's Bravo. I keep on. I get to talk to instead of Jess. Although I feel Jess may listen to one, these every once in a while. But Bravo, if you're if you're listening, uh, a <laughs> little news drop would be be sufficient. I think we'll get it at E3. Probably we're gonna, gonna get a slew of things at E3. Yeah, we're gonna get slapped in the face with a bunch of Halo. It's stuff. like Halo content, Halo content, Halo content, yeah. Halo content, Halo content. If I <laughs> if there's a means for me to go, I am going. To yeah, E3. me too. I like I'll I'll do whatever to get there. I gotta talk to some people and see what the best way is to kind of get into something like that. Yeah, but I want to just go and rip out the Halo community and get as much information as possible. For and sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so next up on the BS Angel uh, going away letter, we have a spot in here where she actually did some VO for Cortana. So whenever they do the lines for the characters, whenever they're kind of scripting out the story uh, before the uh, real voice actors come in, they have studio uh, the people. Temp, the temp. temp yeah, the uh, temp, temp voices. voices. Yeah. So she actually did Cortana. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. Again, that's something I wish I could do someday. <laughs> Wait, you want to do Cortana? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy with doing the temp voice. So B.S. Angel was Cortana for a day. It's my dream. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's like I should be extremely happy or extremely scared. <laughs> I think you should be both. I'd play that game. That that'd probably be the game of the year with your voice. <laughs> oh yeah, it would be. <laughs> One uh, more core to go. <laughs> yeah. Uh good times. There's activity <laughs> on the B net. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing good so far. Yeah. <laughs> but don't quit your day job. <laughs> the next thing in the bulletin for her is um, When You Wish Upon a Star uh, is what it's titled. But there was um, a kid whose Make-A-Wish uh, was made uh, possible by getting him into a Halo game. So this kid named uh, – what's the name here? Shoot. Uh, Matthew got – put into Halo uh, CEA, so Halo CE Anniversary, and he's the mm -hmm. guy that actually greets you when you come out of the crowd tube, crowd tube and runs you through all the tutorials. So oh, this kid, they, they took... Uh, uh, he was 16 years old. Okay. Uh, battled, he battled cancer three different times, and um, on the fourth time, it really hit him hard. So part of the Make-A-Wish um, that they did for him was they immortalized him in Halo... By taking some pictures of him, modeling him, and putting him into Halo CE Anniversary. That's that is, really That cool. is amazing. Yeah. So that is really That's cool. That's awesome. Yes. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, it's fine. But this is one of the cool things that is really nice to see studios do. Go out and participate things in Make-A-Wish, Extra Life, Child's Play, all that kind of thing. Uh, kind of things. So... This was a big moment for her, a big kind of um, uh, monument to when she was a community manager and being able to kind of go out and do this for um, this kid. So really, really fantastic stuff. Really cool. Um, now I want to go play Halo CE just to see the <laughs> see the face again. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, that, that I can't even begin to say how awesome that is. I mean, that's cool. It, it'd be cool to be immortalized in Halo forever. Yeah, especially being, like, the first character you see, other than, like, Master Chief. Yeah, you, you know, they other didn't than the see scenes, that yeah. character. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. They didn't just, like, give him, a, like, a, a Marine yeah. voice that, like, you might or might not, but odds are might not yeah, come everyone's, across. Everyone's going to see that model. Everyone's going to hear that voice. That's That's really cool. Yeah. Well, the voice wasn't his. The voice oh, was done oh, by yeah, a voice actor, but but the the face model was yeah. this kid's, so uh, really cool, really cool stuff. Cool. Another one of Jess's big milestones was the turret of the hog being able to get up in there and uh, test that out, and not being able to see over the chain gun, <laughs> <laughs> as she mentioned in her post. Uh, that's another one of those things that'd be cool to go see 
in in writing in person. We I saw it at Halo Fest, um, or the one that they um, uh, that they had up in. It was one of the first things that you saw when you walked in. Uh huh. Uh, and that was I, cool to see. I remember seeing pictures of that. Is that the same one that like has the uh, the front and back wheels turned like it does in the game? I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, the warthog in the game, if you if you ever uh, look, whenever you're turning, you know, and obviously in a car, you turn the oh, wheel. Oh no, this wheels. doesn't have four wheel drive. Well, the uh, the. Four wheel axle drive. The back, yeah, the back wheels will actually turn along. Yeah, with, with in the game, game, yeah. But no, I don't think they have this in the the real life Warthog that they have. Because I remember, I want to say it was on one of the Bungie podcasts, obviously a long time ago. But uh, well, they had a video of it too. Who did? Uh, Bungie. They were driving it around. I forget who was driving it at the time. Maybe that's what it was then. But I I thought I remembered uh, them saying that the uh, the back wheels on whatever warthog they were riding in actually turned uh the same way uh it does in the game maybe i don't I'm going think crazy so. here no i don't uh, believe i don't believe the the drivable hog is um that has the back wheels turning that's still cool <laughs> sorry yeah. i mean to stop everything down no it's it's fine it's one of those things that it'd be nice to be able to drive around in that one of these days yeah, I would I would want to ride in the passenger seat because I'm not about to flip that thing over. Uh, if I accidentally flip it, I'm not about to flip that thing all the yeah, way. Yeah, and I've, I'm sure everyone's heard the stereotypes with Asians and their ability to drive. So I think I'd stay away from the driver's seat as well. Well, then we're gonna have to fight for the passenger seat. <laughs> Dusty, you can drive. Okay, I'll drive. <laughs> Who's chain gunning though? Well, I'll, I'll chain gun. All right. You get pull through it. For sure. Awesome. I'll uh, rock the AR in the passenger seat and just <laughs> spray, spray it. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think there's much point in praying uh, if, <laughs> if you're doing that in the passenger seat because I, <laughs> I don't know that even God could help you hit anything there. But but I'll oh, definitely boy. be uh, wasting my ammo. So <laughs> I like our odds. Cool. Uh, then the last thing that she has before she leaves the bulletin is just the memories that she's had with the community. She's from the community. She started out in the community and to go into 343 being the community manager and then kind of moving up from there. Um, Turr has just been one of those wonderful things. And I can say from being on the flip side of her community management that it's been wonderful to interact with her and get to do lots of different things with her. And I'm happy that she's moving up and uh, it's been wonderful, Jess. I think all of us can say that, except for maybe Justin, because he actually hasn't met her yet. <laughs> yeah, when I met her at uh, the Halo 4 Global Championship, she was like the most kindest, most down-to-earth, um, least selfish person I've ever met. Like sh- She was just making sure everyone there was you know, having a good time, knew what was going on. Uh, sh- she helped out so much uh, during my time there. Yeah, she's really great to work with. Yeah. And it's not like she's going away for good. It's She's yeah. still going to be around Twitter and Xbox and probably going to a bunch of different conventions as well. She's not mm-hmm. completely out of the picture. She's just holding a different job title now. Yeah. So, and I guess, I, I I guess will, we... Oh, yeah. Go ahead. All right. I, I, I am going to put this out there. Uh, I took the last picture that she has in there, so... Yes! Oh, nice. Go, go us. <laughs> Uh, for everyone that's interested, Godzilla T just put the video of the bungee hog in the chat stream. So Ooh. if you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's pretty uh pretty cool. They actually uh whoever was driving it actually hit um a wooden post and chipped it a little <laughs> bit. So it's it's kinda of funny. Um but let's move on to the rest of the bulletin, kind of wrap this up to get into our Titanfall stuff. Matchmaking playlist update. This week we got Proving Ground and Extraction on the matchmaking update. Uh, extraction is back again from just the uh, what it was before. It rotated out and now it's back. So if you're looking for Extraction commendations, make sure you hit up the playlist um, this week and for next week. And it'll be rotating out uh, next week to be replaced by Squad DLC. Um, but there's also Proving Grounds, and I actually haven't played it yet. Have either of you managed to play the playlist yet and noticed any big differences other than what was described? Uh, I haven't gotten a chance, but I watched a video on it, and I saw a stream of it, and it, it looked pretty good. It 
it surprised me that there was radar because it's supposed to replace Team Throwdown, which didn't have radar. But other than that, it, it looked pretty interesting. I have not. I haven't done anything so far. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it easy enough. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was one of the things that they were changing up for Proving Grounds. It was more to be like legendary BRs, which had uh, radar to begin with. I see. So we have this kind of competitive side of having the BRs there, but it has the radar in there. So it's kind of a mix of both worlds, Yeah. kind of between the casual and the competitive. And another thing to note, if you haven't listened to our last few shows or haven't been paying attention to the bulletins or anything we put point has posted over the last couple of weeks is that's where the um top 200 slayer is moving yep. to mm-hmm. so last week was the end of season two so season three is now uh starting this week and is entering into the proving grounds playlist so that's where you want to go if you are partaking in that um that top 200 list we have uh <clears throat> the community choice poll for big team battle which will be coming up. Um, is that the one that's next week? Not squad DLC? Yeah, that's right. Sorry, my bad. Um, big Team Battle is going to be between Neutral Flag, Legendary Slayer BR, and Team Snipers. What was the first one? Team Flag? Uh, Neutral. Neutral Flag. Legendary Neutral flag. Slayer BR and Team Snipers. So, these, I mean, the Neutral Flag, we've had it in the CTF playlist for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um I've managed to play it a few times, and it's yeah, same here. It's mostly comes that. up on Ragnarok a lot. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't think I've played it on many other maps. I've played it on um, Erosion a couple times. No, no Exile. Sorry, Exile a couple times, mm-hmm. and it's it's kind of an interesting. Um, it's, a, it's a different experience in Halo Four, I feel, than it has been in past Halo games. Um, just in because play. of of how the game flows now, and you have a bunch of different things added that weren't in previous games, like the sprinting, the armor abilities, and other things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, tactics, I don't know if you guys have played Neutral Flag, but tactics seem um, kind of different than previous versions of Neutral Flag, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Mm-hmm. But it kind of does pull to question some of the other game types that they could have included in Halo 4, which it didn't like. Um, stockpile. neutral bomb assault. What'd you say? Stockpile. I missed that one from uh, stockpile. Halo Reach. Yeah. Stockpile was pretty good. Yeah, I think I find it kind of funny or odd or whatever that uh, it's like whenever there is like just totally new game types uh, that you know come out in each game, like uh, like stockpile or headhunter or uh, what's uh, Dominion or that's what. That was a new one. Invasion. In well, no, I'm th- I'm thinking of Halo Four now. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, Extraction. Yeah. Is Dominion one, or am I making that up? Yeah, Dominion's one in Halo yep. Four, a new okay. one. It like it. They never seem to like stick around or actually ever end up being all that popular. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I, uh, I, I freaking love uh capture the flag in Halo Four. Um. And uh, I I've played quite a bit of it, um, and I really I really enjoy Neutral Flag, uh, and I, most of the time I've played it, uh, from what I can remember, anyways, has been on uh, Ragnarok. But I mean that that really is a, I mean it's almost uh, tailor made for Capture the Flag games. It kind of yeah. is, although I would like to see the experience in Halo Four kind of go back to its Halo 3 roots and instead of the Mantises have the Wraiths. I would just like to try that mm-hmm. because it does add a little bit different strategy to the whole map and when you're actually doing the game types on there. Not to say that the Mantis is a, a bad vehicle to use. I just feel um, that they don't how... necessarily fit in that map game type combination. Yeah. Well, for Capture the Flag, I... Just I like it when it's just uh, warthogs and um, mongoose, 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 mongooses. Mongoose. Either way, either way Mon- is technically correct. Mongoose is. Uh, <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, whenever there's there's no like heavy um, vehicles. Heavy, yeah, heavy vehicles or 
what you know anything like that just mm -hmm. uh just the players and uh a way to get to the other side of the map quickly so yeah, i, I kind of agree with you there like one of, one of my favorite maps uh was in halo 3 i know a lot of people hated it but a uh, standoff because it was just uh warthogs mongooses or mongoot yeah, mon, mon, geese. <laughs> mon geese. Yeah, and then two two camos and rocket or laser in the middle. It was pretty. It was pretty stripped down, and it, it just came down to like team coordination and things like that. I love yeah. standoff. Yeah, that was one of my favorite maps in Halo Three. Yeah, I love that map, but a lot of people give me flack when I tell them that. You know, the it, map was, it was I, fun. The map I hate in Halo Three that like everybody else feels pr like seems like the exact opposite. I mean, again, maybe I'm just crazy, but I, with a passion, hate Guardian. Ooh, that's Guardians. Like a Guardians, a love hate for me. Yeah, uh, I can see that. There's no love uh, <laughs> in me for Guardian. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a very iconic map to Halo Three, though. I feel. Yeah, yeah. it definitely is. Uh, but I hate I hate it. I love Halo Three though. <laughs> The one part I do, uh, I don't like about that map is is snipe three. That little turnaround ramp that, mm -hmm. and people mm -hmm. just peeking over and and that just railing. Yeah, yeah. I hate that railing. <laughs> <laughs> I hate uh, all the railings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have some more uh things on the bulletin to wrap up. Uh, we have a live stream coming tomorrow of this recording actually. So by the time you're listening to this, it's probably actually over, unfortunately. But in case you did get to catch it, um, Friday stream at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I'm going to guess that's Pacific Daylight Time. Yeah, probably. Because we're in, we are in daylight time. Because if it's, if it's 1 p.m. Standard Time, that means it's actually 12 p.m. Oh, daylight yeah. time. But anyways. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, there's going to be an exhibition match between the 343 pros that 343 has hired on for uh, the testing that they're doing and the community pro team. So, and these, uh, these compose of, on the 343 side, Neighbor, Ghost Ayame, Dursky, and Killer 5, or Killer V, however you say it. Mm -hmm. I and then, I bet it's a V. <laughs> Sorry. APK probably knows a little bit more. Uh, he's, as far as I know, he, he wasn't I a I think it's Killer player. 5. Yeah, but yeah, I, don't, I think it's I Killer know. 5. Um, and then on the community pro side, we have Ace, Strong Side, Flame Sword, and Snakebite. Yeah, I would give the edge there to the community team just because they have the Halo 4 Global Champion. Yeah, that's one reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Ghost Yame, while he's good, I think he's not quite in practice with yeah. uh, his competitive skill. Dursky and Neighbor, I think, would be probably the two to watch on that side. For but, sure. Dursky especially. Yeah, but on the community side, you have pretty much all four of them to watch out for. Yeah, all four of them have their own unique abilities. Mm -hmm. um, I got to talk with Ace on the podcast after the Global Championship, which was really cool uh, to talk to him and and get mm -hmm. his thoughts behind the experience. I got to talk to Strong Side a lot at RTX. Uh, I met Flame Sword in passing at RTX as well. I haven't talked to Snakebite at all, but um, an interesting little tidbit. I will jump in here and say that uh, both Strong Side and Flame Sword contributed to the titanfall guide yep they did For, that's uh, true prima yeah yep to the prima game yeah and they actually gave some of those away they signed and gave them gave them away unfortunately i didn't win one but <laughs> 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 but yeah so we have uh a good matchup i think this is going to be really interesting but if i go down to skill wise how i think it's going to turn out it's probably going to be the community team yeah i'd put my bet on them if I was a betting man. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> but good luck to both teams. Uh, see you on the battlefield uh, for us tomorrow at 1 o'clock uh, Pacific time. Oh, and that will be if... Um, well, by the time you're listening to this, it's not going to matter anyways. But for those in the live stream, it's going to be on the official Xbox Twitch stream. So catch it tomorrow, March 21st, 1 p.m. Pacific time on xbox twitch channel uh wrapping up the bulletin as we always do is the screenshot spotlight and this week it is fire so we have a bunch of flaming screenshots <laughs> uh 
as we <laughs> always do, we're going to pick some of the favorite ones. Um, I am going to go with Destruction by Skanik. I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> Sounds right. Um, Firestarter by Gothic Lucy. Human Meteor by TRX-117. Uh, and The Death of a Star by Monkey Ninja 4C, or Monkey Ninja Ace, I guess is how you would say that. I got to disagree. Uh, <laughs> I like... Human, Which one do you like? I like hum, either Human Meteor by TRX-117 or uh, Burning Up by Receptor-17. Dang it. I was going to say I was going to go one and done with uh, Burning Up by Receptor-17. <laughs> <laughs> Receptor does make some pretty cool screenshots. And uh, I actually played with him in last week's play date. And he, we're going to get him on the show uh in the couple of weeks, uh, probably either next month or the month after, to talk about um, screenshots for Halo and how to how to play that into Halo Five. Mm-hmm. So, but if you're gonna use the screenshot for the album art of this episode, though, I would go with if if it were me, I'd go with Human Meteor uh, because uh, I have to be honest, I'm not too sure exactly how much that reads as halo uh if you're do if you're doing the album art thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah i still gotta choose but it'll probably be be between human meteor and destruction but we'll we, we'll see <laughs> probably <laughs> human meteor if i had to take a guess it's another good one yeah so that's an interesting that, smoke effect though in destruction i believe that's just the background art that's all that is it's it's on um that dlc man um um landfall yeah never noticed that it's before. really it's a really cool backdrop and that's just him uh in one of the poses i think for uh it's like just the loading or maybe? It's, it's it's a reload or an assassination one of the two and uh, it's just against the backdrop nice yeah yeah Interesting. Uh, now that you mentioned that yeah it does look like a melee animation uh instead of the punching i guess the punching would have been the plasma pistol never mind anywho uh that's it for the bulletin for this week now to move on to the main attraction for our show this week titanfall so we have all played titanfall we all played in the i think we all played in the alpha and the beta and have the game currently i played in the beta not the okay alpha. all right I, so, I was jealous though that you that uh <laughs> people got to the alpha yeah it's it was a lot of fun for the alpha and once i played it I made a tweet and like take my money. <laughs> respawn. <laughs> it's like the because I I was honestly I was skeptical for a bit. Uh, I didn't get to play it at PAX last year, so I didn't have a good idea of what was going on with the game. I heard a lot of people say that they were really looking forward to it, but I never had that experience for myself until I picked it up with the alpha. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this game is awesome! Yeah, and this is, I, and this I is why I'm doing it. a podcast now on it. I was gonna buy it no matter what. Because it was, you know, I had heard uh, that it was a sci-fi shooter and that it was going to be on the Xbox One. And there's not a lot uh, that you can do with an Xbox One currently, uh, for if you're me, if you're me. So uh, there was, I mean, I, I looked at like, uh, you know, the trailers and all, all that stuff, obviously. But uh, I would have bought it sight unseen. And because I heard it looked really cool. <laughs> and uh, I confirmed that it indeed looked very cool. <laughs> but yeah, whenever I heard about it, it was I was, it was an automatic, like, no-brainer. Yeah, when I played it at PAX last year, I just, like, I knew it was, like, an immediate must-buy for me just because it was actually a shooter that was refreshing and something I hadn't really experienced before with a with a video game at all. And then after playing it in the alpha, um, like between the the time between the alpha and the beta, I had like serious withdrawal issues. Like no other games did it for me. I just couldn't game anymore. And then when the beta finally came around, like I played so much then and then withdrawal again after the beta and then finally got it at release and been playing a lot. Yeah. In the past and it's, week. it's really fun guys. If you haven't bought it yet, um, if you don't have an Xbox 
One, then it's coming out on the Xbox 360, I believe, April 4th. They pushed it back a week. Mm-hmm. I thought it was supposed to come out a, a week after the Xbox One version. It's supposed to come out two weeks after the Xbox One version. Uh, and then they just announced, like, I think it was two days ago or maybe three. Two days ago, yeah. Pu- yeah, they had to push it back again because they want to make sure it's a solid product. Yeah. I think they're, I think they're just... Uh, trolling the 360 guys. <laughs> I think it because there was like uh, like some insiders shared info that the 360 version was less than 720p resolution and it had less than like 30 frames per second. So I'm guessing like they wanted to like stabilize the performance of the 360 version. Man, that would make un- sense. Under 720. Yeah. Wow. Because the thing is, with the uh, Xbox One version, they use the cloud for all the all the AI and like all the computing that comes with the AI. So like having to bring that over on the 360 without the cloud power uh, probably takes a huge toll on everything else. Well, and another studio is working on the 360 port of the game, and I don't know yep. if they're actually going through. Because I would assume for the AI stuff, they would put that on EA servers instead of Xbox Azure cloud servers. Yeah, we, I would did, think. we did hear about uh, the like all the extra, uh, I don't know, everything that comes with the Xbox One's, uh, you know, flavor of Xbox Live. How, uh, you know, some of the game uh, would be like, uh, man, I'm blanking on exactly what the wording they used, but like uh, that they could leverage the power of the. Uh, all those Azure uh, data centers to mm-hmm. actually process some of the the games. Does, uh, does this sound familiar to anybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it definitely does. Because whenever whenever you first hear that, you you know, I thought like, there in what world could that ever do anything? But I mm-hmm. I think they found a, a tremendous use for it. For sure, it's it's really cool the technology that they're putting in behind this service and it just titanfall is a very good example of it they did a very good job with making the game utilize these services and you know i mean the the future of gaming on the xbox live platform is is kind of bright now that titanfall is out and really showing off what it can do yeah Absolutely. like if there were any like major setbacks or like hiccups when it came to titanfall's launch other than like xbox live being down but that was like an independent issue um but if there were any like huge issues with titanfall's launch and i think microsoft would have been in a lot of trouble just because like this was the one big release people were going to buy the console for and uh it was just it's nice to see respawn really pull through and then especially since it was published by ea and all the flack and the bad reputation that ea has especially with battle battlefield 4 recently uh, it was just nice to see a solid launch and a lot of that had to do with the alpha and the beta so perhaps to respawn for you know putting in the work and polish to ensure that yeah and that's one of the things i want to touch on here Mm -hmm. um in a minute is just the experience that we got from the alpha and the beta and the community interaction that we had from the staff over at respawn was just like top notch. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I've ever experienced a beta and an alpha as well conducted as it was for Titanfall. No, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. The uh, support and the responses that we got out of the community team over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and you- even for kind of a newer studio, it's, it's a real blessing to the gaming industry to see this kind of output and dedication to the game and the community that it's built. Yeah, and the fact that they like there wasn't really a lot of marketing at least not until like maybe a few weeks before release and like the beta was kind of like their biggest marketing tool and it was kind of their way to prove the quality of their product to the consumer base which was which was huge and it probably helped them sell so many more copies. Especially yeah. to people who are skeptical. Well, and I was one of those people too. Until yeah. I played the alpha and the beta, I'm like, okay, I get why this is so popular yeah. now. <laughs> I'm buying it. Yeah. And I even after the after I was done playing the alpha, or actually in the middle of playing the alpha, I went online and pre-ordered the collector's edition because <laughs> I was that impressed with the game. Yeah. So you and the collector's both... edition is sweet. 
you guys were both in the alpha. I, mm-hmm. I just real quick want to know, like, are you, can you guys now talk about anything that was in the alpha or does your guys, uh, well, everything that's in the alpha is technically in the game right now. Yeah, I just I know that sometimes there's crazy. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's like an NDA that you're not. You're. I think it's like everlasting too that you're not supposed to yeah. like talk about it except for the fact that you were. A exactly. you were in it. Yeah. yeah exactly. exactly. So, uh, you guys wouldn't be able to answer the question of like the differences that you guys saw in the uh, alpha versus the beta? I don't think any specifics, but I will say, I'll take the risk. I I will say it was ridiculously impressive in the improvement and graphical fidelity between the alpha and the beta. Like, Well, they they came out and said that for for the alpha, they weren't really testing the graphical ability of it. It was a, it was a stress test on the network. It was a performance yeah. test. Yeah. Yeah. They said graphics. They officially came out and said graphics in the alpha were twenty five percent of the final product in terms yeah. of resolution. It's a it's a stunning game though visually. Yeah. If you and this if you have the hardware to run it and they just came out with the patch for the PC to bump it up to four K I think today. Yeah, that's nuts. Like I, I play on PC right now, and like one of the I guess the biggest concern I had with Titanfall is. With a lot of the E3 and early footage, it looked like the game was really, like, the graphics were kind of cheap and kind of looked a little dated to me. But full release, like, the the textures and everything is just so nice. Like, it's ridiculous. It was stunning. Yeah. So you play it, so you're on the PC then? You, you're not on the Xbox One? Is that yeah, right? Yeah, because my Xbox One currently is, is without a functioning power supply unit. I'm currently getting a Oops. placement ship to me. Yeah, it was horrible timing for me. Did it? Did it just go bad, or did you, did you like uh, spill something? <laughs> uh, it just it just went bad. Like every time I turned on my Xbox, it would turn directly off. So yeah, yeah. yikes. So I want to talk about a few things with regards to the alpha and the beta that we can kind of take back to what we can see with the next Halo. Everyone is screaming that we need a beta in Halo Five. It's mm-hmm apparent at this point that in order to ensure that the people are going to be happy with the experience and happy with uh, the kind of gameplay that we expect from Halo, that 343 really needs to kind of buckle down and just bite the bull and and give us a beta. If not a public one that's open to everyone, at least a closed beta that has some uh, public avenues. So everyone... So the way that Titanfall beta was originally going to be done was you got a code. You could sign up for a code or they would give away code and you could do it that way Mm -hmm. um, before they opened it up to everyone on the Xbox One. Um, But they allowed you to um, stream and talk about it. And I think that's the same thing that needs to happen with Halo 5 where um, it needs to be at least publicly known and available. And for those that are participating in it, if it's not completely open, to allow people to stream it voice their opinions on it, talk about it in a way that will generate discussions around the community to get a good consensus on what people feel that of the experience that they're making. Yeah, definitely. Especially, like, I love all the guys at 343 Industries, and I love all the guys at Bungie, but, like, a lot of the things that were said during the marketing period for Halo Reach and for Halo 4 just, like, turned out to be, I'd say, misleading or just, like, flat-out true. So I think uh, Respawn showed that if you're going to make claims about your game, like people were worried when it was announced there was a 6v6 uh, max player count. And when they talked about like the prevalence of the AI in the game, like there was a human humongous backlash when that news came out. And the only thing Respawn said was just wait till you'll play it. Uh, we'll show you that it works. Uh, we'll show you that it plays really well. And I think that's kind of like the approach uh, 343 should take with Halo is that Instead of like trying to convince us that it's going to be good or it's going to be okay, they should just give us the ability to see ourselves. Yeah, you know, I, th- it's, I think it's kind of a, it would be kind of a risky thing for uh, 343 to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I mean, I agree with everything that you guys have just said. Uh, but, I mean, it's, it's also... Um, well, I just like I just said, it, it's uh, it's risky. It's yeah. really risky because it yeah. could it could totally shift the sales of your product. I mean, it could go either way, but 
the potential for it to go south is is really high if your product doesn't meet the expectations or the desires of the of the player base yeah i mean it you know it i almost think that if if they stay on because you know i think 343 uh had i'll I'll say had a decision to make because i'm you know we it's probably already been made we just don't know about it yet Mm -hmm. but uh you know the they have two roads they could go down at this point and that is stay with what was in Halo 4 mm-hmm. uh, or, um, you know, go down the, uh, you know, more bungee style uh, type of gameplay road. Yeah. And uh, I almost think that, like, if it were me in charge, uh, if I was going to continue down the Halo 4 route, I wouldn't do a beta. Yeah, definitely. Like, if, if they're continuing with that direction... It's probably in their best interest to hide it as much as possible. But hopefully, with the success of Titanfall and all the buzz it's generated, hopefully it's proved to developers that, you know, you don't have to be COD to beat COD. Like, you can just be your own game with your own identity, with your own niche and your own style of gameplay, and you can do just fine. And, like, yep. Titanfall shows that. Like, if if you're if you have an identity as a game, people are going to be interested in playing you because if people have a choice between playing the real thing or a cheap imitation, they'll always play the real thing instead. So I think and that just kind of proves the point of the whole recent outflow to Halo 3. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A lot of people, and that also comes with the demand for Halo 2 anniversary. Like people want Halo to be Halo and they want to play what they know as Halo. Yeah. You know, I almost, kind of look at it as like music in the sense that uh you know if you kind of look at like the cod style of first person shooters uh it's almost just like listening to top 40 radio you know like it, everything's kind of sounds the same mm-hmm. uh you know and then all of a sudden like titanfall comes in and you could equate that to you know suddenly a song that doesn't sound like any other song that you you know you've ever heard on top 40 kind of come out of nowhere and you're like Mm -hmm. oh this this is nice i this has a you know this has like you said an identity and a you know its own style it is its own entity and that uh you know like i i totally understand and i just want to state like for the record uh uh, make sure the uh, girl in the corner is taking this down. Uh, that um, <laughs> I I I personally love Halo Four. I really do. Like I have, t- I can't tell you how much fun I have playing Halo Four. But uh, I still think that you know it's I I, I give I applaud three four three for trying to do it kind of like on their own terms. I guess you know. Yeah. Uh, and trying to make Halo their own, uh, mm-hmm. they just, you know, it just didn't work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, they, they, I, I really do think that this should, you know, not just, uh, not just all the, uh, game or the studios, but like just three, four, three specifically, I think needs to be paying ultra attention to everything about Titanfall. All definitely, definitely. I mean, they... well, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have this podcast is to talk about some of the things that we can take from Titanfall and apply it to Halo Five, and what we can see be a positive influence. And you guys kind of talk, touched on a lot of things that I want to kind of cover in more detail, but mm-hmm. um, I kind of want to get back to the <clears throat> whole alpha beta thing and, and wrap that up. Oh, because sure, what, sorry. what we no, I mean it's fine. It's it's all good discussion. Um, but <clears throat> what we saw from the alpha and the beta also is not necessarily um, them looking for changes to the experience that they were making. Granted, this was this is the first time they're making a game. They're kind of defining their own experience. But we have to kind of take account into Halo that we already have a set expectation of what we think the Halo gameplay needs to be. Mm-hmm. So on top of kind of just testing the network, which I don't think 
they would have to worry about too much other than making sure that their networking stuff is set because I think Titanfall has helped Microsoft iron out a lot of those cloud service things yeah. Oh, yeah, that, ne- that need to be fixed. So it wouldn't necessarily be testing that as much. But in terms of what Halo 5 would need for a beta, you need to put it out a lot earlier than Titanfall did. Yes. Yeah, if you're trying uh, to make like gameplay changes. Because yeah. the beta ended with how many weeks until release? I think three it was weeks. three. Three weeks. Yeah. You definitely would need a lot more time between the end of the beta and release if you're trying to make fundamental changes to the game. Well, you have to also remember there's always those, uh, you know, day one updates. Yeah, true. Um, but so, yeah. but with that though, you have to get it early enough to do that change, do those changes. And then the funny thing about the ta- the Titanfall Alpha and the Beta was I actually had a friend from work comment on. Uh, when I was playing the alphas, like with with how soon the game's coming out, this sounds more like a beta. Yeah, yeah, Wh- a lot which, of yeah. I in a that. in a normal situation, that'd be true. The the alpha is kind of testing a lot of um, earlier builds and bugs and making yeah. sure that it really fits in with the game. And then your beta is when it gets uh, you make those changes and it goes out to everyone. Respawn did a little bit differently, but traditionally, uh, with what we would have with the Halo 5 beta, it really needs to be early on, probably three months out at the most, um, at, well, at the least, mm-hmm. if not more than that, to really get a good feeling of what the community has out there. Because, I mean, let's face it, they, they brought a new experience to Halo 4, and some aspects of it were good and fresh, and some of it were crappy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if they're looking for a balance of that, they need... Uh, a good community base to really help define that, and they've they're making a good start by hiring some of these Halo Four pros and a lot of former pro Halo pros as well. But you have to look at the community as a whole. The competitive people are going to really nail down the core experience, but to get that kind of fluff on top of it, you need to involve the rest of the community, and that's where um, either an open beta or a closed beta with public view into it would be beneficial to the Halo franchise. And I think that's kind of one of the things that most everyone expects out of the Halo franchise. And if we don't see it, people are going to be very, very worried. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I like, don't know. Look- I don't know that it would make people. I mean, I think people are about as worried as they can get right now. Or if not, if not that, then like they're close enough to it to where I think that, if there was a lack of a beta uh, for Halo 5, then, I mean, I, I, I think it would upset a lot of people, but I think that, like, I don't know, the people, who are, yeah, the people who are still left in the community uh, are already, like, ultra worried. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, I mean, I don't know how much more worried people can really be. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, they need to do something. Like, you know, I, I don't I don't know how they could really fix this problem, uh, you know, other than, uh, you know, like like we've already said, listen to what, you know, the community wants in, in this game or out of this game, you know, yeah. and yeah, how, however they need to do it, then do it. You know, like if 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 they don't want to do a beta, then then like, you know, fine, whatever. But like you better make, you know, you better make up what you would have gained with a beta, like make that up another way. I don't well, know and someone just be. said in the, in the chat, um, Corona Chris said that the community as a whole is what influenced all this, the stuff that we saw in Halo 4 that was bad, which I don't necessarily think is the case because we see a lot of influence just from 343 trying to be its own studio and kind of present its own flavor of Halo. Yeah. And the the fact that the majority of the Halo community and even like casual players that I know play Halo ha- that and have left Halo because of the experience, I don't think would really influence the studio in that way to make the quote unquote crappy experience for Halo Four. Now, granted, you don't want to take all the ideas that the community has to throw out there. You want a general set of what people think of the core experience needs to be, and then let the team there the competitive team build that experience and then have the rest of the community kind of develop that fluff. And that fluff being the game types to bring back into Halo. Some of the features, like I would personally like to see Sprint stay in 
um, take out the armor abilities, take out the loadouts, that kind of stuff. Get a general feel for what um, kind of the core community, the the community that has helped build Halo, feel about the game. Yeah, yeah. and like going going back to a point you made a little bit earlier was um, like my, my younger brother, he's a very casual Halo player. Like he played a lot of Halo when it was really popular with like Halo 2 and Halo 3. And then with Halo Reach, he started getting discouraged from Halo because uh, things of like like Sprint, um, having loadouts, things like that, just things that kind of hinted at a COD direction, a Call of Duty direction. And then for Halo 4 to take all of those changes to the Halo formula and take them one step further, that further discouraged him from playing. And I talked to him over my winter break just because I was curious about his like views on Halo. And he said, you know, he, he said like him and his friends never thought Halo needed those things. And when they were added, um, they didn't see any reason why to bother. So like yeah. kind of going back to that point I made earlier about either playing the real thing or an imitation, like they'll take the real thing. And my, my, my younger brother is a very big call of duty fan. And like he, he obviously picked call of duty over halo. And so going back on the, the community asked for it, I don't think really anyone saw the changes halo reach brought and asked for more of that. I think there was more of a response to kind of take those things away. Yeah. I, I'm right there with you uh, about the, about reach I, I personally didn't care much for reach uh but um but yeah i mean like the the thing about about kind of you know trying to do do the whole me too type of thing you know in halo 4 with like oh now now we've got loadouts too mm-hmm. and and all that like you can't out call of duty call of you know call of duty like yeah you know there's uh you know I'm a firm believer in, you know, you have to, you have to do what is, you know, your thing. You have to do your, your own thing. If you can, like, you can, sure, you can copy somebody, but mm-hmm. like, you, you'll never be able to do a better job at, you know, whatever you're trying to copy. Yeah. The original is going yeah. to be the, what's put on the pedestal. And if you ever try emulating that, you're always going to fall short of that pedestal. So you might as well try to try to be your own thing so you can be the pedestal, which Halo was back in Halo 2, Halo 3. And even even when Halo Reach was unpopular in the in the eyes of like hardcore Halo fans, it, it still sustained pretty good population numbers. And I mean, I've, as we've seen Halo depart from its core formula, we've seen, you know, Halo suffer population wise and longevity wise yeah and one of the things about halo from a uh kind of a core gameplay perspective is it it does have a um steeper uh or a wider skill gap yeah and learning curve than a lot of other games do which is um i think one of the things that kind of sets halo apart or used to set it apart from these other franchises and there are some things between games that you're going to see get implemented, which is kind oh, of yeah. becoming a standard first-person shooter. So, like, sprinting, mm-hmm. for example. Every yeah. game, every first-person sh- shooter game has sprinting now, pretty much. So, it's not something that I think should be taken out of Halo, but it's, it's a good addition to kind of incorporate some of the things. that Those kind of gameplay elements are good things to kind of copy. But when you're copying the entire experience, like, for... The the loadouts in Halo Four is pretty yeah is yeah. pretty much an exact replica of the Call of Duty system. Yeah. Well, it's well, it's not exactly a direct copy because it's with pretty Call close. Of, with Call of Duty, well, where I'm going with this is with Call of Duty, they're they are constantly rewarding you with like unlocks and things like that. Like in in Halo Four, uh, the like all the you weapons got that are during on, your specializations. Yeah, you you, st- you still have the and your Spartan like, points. Uh, yeah, there's specializations, but like with you Call have to of... unlock your weapons. Yeah, yeah, I know. yeah, no. What I'm saying is though, with with Call of Duty, the whole you know loadout thing uh, is kind of made like I don't know. I feel the way it it because I love Call of Duty. I'll 
Uh, well, you yeah, know what? Loves, loves probably a strong word, but I, I really enjoy <laughs> Call of Duty. <laughs> um, and uh, I feel like one, one, one of the things I, I like the most about Call of Duty is it always keeps me like wanting to, uh, I, I could probably fit in two more games, you know, or, or one more game, one more game. I, I almost, yeah. I almost uh, can unlock like the, the red dots, you know, whatever. Mm. And with Halo 4, uh, they took the whole loadout thing and implemented it and took some weapons that you have to unlock, whether it's with Spartan points or whatever, uh, and they put that in. But the thing is, is like there's not nearly as many weapons in Halo as there is in Call of Duty. And I feel like that's one reason the... Uh, the whole loadout thing works for Call of Duty is that you're always, uh, you know, you're always on the precipice of unlocking something else. Whereas with Halo, Halo Four, I'm, you know, yeah, there's the specializations, but you know, there's not the type of, there's not the wet the, uh, what am I trying to say here, the the breadth of weapons. And I feel like because you unlock all your weapons and things uh, fairly early on in your uh, in your whole rank thing, mm -hmm. uh, it it kind of like stops. I, don't know, I feel like it. It minimizes that. that yeah. Yeah. That exactly. Essence. Yeah. Yeah. So, because I mean, Battlefield does a good job with you know. There's always something else that you don't have, uh, weapon wise. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, they were able to figure out that. But, I mean, I I don't know. I, I'm probably uh, just rambling here, but I, I don't know. <laughs> well, and it's an interesting thing to point out with the loadouts, too, because it's it's a fickle thing with Halo. Because at, at, in one side, I want them completely gone. Because in my mind, Halo is an experience about balance and about... About More equality, about like skill. everything. Yeah. yeah, everyone spawns like traditionally in Halo. Everyone spawns with the same abilities, the same characteristics, um, the same weapon, the same grenade type. And what separates you from other players is your play style and your your skill and like your your knowledge of the game. But like with Halo Four and Halo Reach, it was like you kind of spawn similarly. You have similar mechanics, but you know, if you want to regen your shields faster, you can do that. And the issue that that was prevalent with Halo 4 is you could never, like, you could never, uh, I don't know how to explain. Like, there, there was no indication of what a player was using just by, like, looking at them. Like, I couldn't look at a Spartan and say, oh, his player is wearing a cloak, which means he has, you know, this specialization. Which would have made, like, loadouts a little bit more tolerable, but... As a whole, like loadouts, probably should just go. Yeah, it, but on the flip side, it's hard to say that because if you look at every other game, Battlefield has loadouts, Call of Duty has loadouts, Titanfall has loadouts. So that De Destiny's going to have loadouts. Destiny will have loadouts. So it's we're kind of caught in this back and forth between a lot of what at least I wouldn't consider the core Halo community does not want loadouts. They mm -hmm. want an experience that is balanced across the board like the previous games have been. Yeah. Like the, the experience that everyone has come to know and love about Halo. But on the flip side, if all the other games are moving towards the systems of loadouts, then Halo has to find its right balance to use loadouts. Mm -hmm. I definitely think it's possible to yeah. incorporate that kind of system, but the way it was implemented in Halo 4 was, was not, not one that was conducive to classical Halo gameplay and not something that is really a balancing factor. Because look at Personal Ordinance, for example. You could be one of the best players in Halo and go up against a, a newbie and he'll get Personal Ordinance of Rockets because he's just gotten a bunch of assists and yeah. you'll get Ordinance with uh, thrust, like a uh, speed boost and plasma grenades. Yeah. <laughs> And a needler. Uh. And a needler. <laughs> so it, it introduces this big imbalance to the game. And also part of the other loadouts, um, like being able to spawn with a bolt shot or a plasma pistol. 
Yeah, there's a lot really of really changes changes the dynamic of the game drastically from what it has been traditionally. Yeah, you can it, it the plasma pistol, for example, makes Big the vehicles battle. in the game pointless. Yeah, to an extent, and, and it's exasperated by the fact that you also can spawn with stickies, so it's just mm-hmm. it just multiplies itself exponentially. And yeah, going back to like how Halo can satisfy like the loadout condition while still being uh, like true to its core formula. I think in my opinion, at least I'm not an expert or like a developer. So, you know, I don't, I don't know best, but I think the best solution for that is maybe allow players to spawn with the primary weapon they want and make sure like all the primary weapons are like balanced and essentially equal. Um, And like, let them customize like weapons. I think one of the cool things Halo 4 did was, um, the weapon skins, and especially with the the champions bundle, I thought a lot of those weapon school weapon skins were really cool, and that's something I'd love to see more in Halo. And it's it's actually one of the things Halo Halo Reach did really well is they tied your progression system with cosmetic unlocks. It wasn't like exactly gameplay related unlocks, and it like and even though like you could say well cosmetic doesn't have its importance, how is that going to drive a player to want to play more? Well, like every day I would get on Halo Reach just to look at the challenges for the credits so I could, you know, level up my player and unlock like all the different armor variants and things like that. Like that, that credit that, system was tough. Yeah, it, it was. It, it was it pushed tough. you. Yeah, one, it one of these battles was it pushed you to keep on playing yeah. and to do well. Yeah. And like I played Halo Reach for two years pretty like I played a good amount like daily and from week to week. And I, I, I never hit, I think it was, yeah, it was Inheritor, which was the max rank. And, like, I'd rather have a system that where the the end goal is really hard to reach as opposed to, like, Halo 4 where SR-130 is just a Three weeks walk. away. Yeah. yeah. It, and I don't know. I don't know. I just feel like if you if you just try to make players who don't play a lot or who who aren't experienced just feel good about themselves you're just you're ending up having all the players who actually spend a lot of time and actually care about the game they're going to reach those end goals really quickly and the game there's like nothing left for them to play for especially and this is a whole nother like huge point that's been beaten to death across the halo community is the importance of the ranking system like you have to have features in the game that help the longevity of the game. Like a feature like Forge helps the longevity of the game because it provides new content for players to play on. Um, theater, you know, it encourages players to play more to capture, you know, those special moments. Multiplayer in Halo 4 kind of missed that characteristic. And I think that's a big part of recapturing the Halo audience. Yeah. And it's definitely one of those big topics, uh, both Forge and the whole uh, progression system that we're going to cover in mm-hmm. some upcoming weeks. But um, back yeah, to the loadouts. I, I, uh, I, I, for the loadout thing, though, I don't know. Like, on one on one hand, uh, I, I couldn't agree more about how, you know, it, things have evolved. Uh, you know, just the, just the industry of people making triple a fps games mm, like uh, the standards and expectations yeah like you know on one hand i couldn't agree more that like you know things have kind of evolved to a point where it you, you almost have to have some of that but like on on the other hand though i think that one thing that made uh that made halo kind of stand out and and sort of like stood the test of time especially like halo 3 i guess is what i'm Mm -hmm. talking about halo 3 and uh, i guess halo 2 uh but um you know was it's like simplicity you know it uh there's a saying that they uh they have about uh poker you know where they say it takes a minute to learn and a lifetime to master yeah I, i kind of always felt that way about uh, Halo, Definitely. in that in that you know like the controls are fairly you know simple the mm-hmm. you know you you the games or the match starts and okay go go kill the other team that's it like you yeah. know, know like oh before you start what do you want to start with do you want to yeah. start with these 
eight <laughs> things or these other eight things or would you like to put your own set of you know eight things to get you know yeah like it was it was his, its simplicity i feel like that that kind of made what what a lot of people consider halo you know like i don't know well, I, I, I think it was I, that kind of harkens back to the the golden triangle of halo guns grenades and melee yeah well, yeah, and then it, and just, then it kind of expanded from there with vehicles in Halo Two, um, more or less. And as mm-hmm. the games kind of matured on, some other things would get thrown in there. But if you, if we go back to the whole loadout, th- well, we're on the loadout thing. But looking at what can be done with Halo, I, I feel that there's just something there that needs to be kind of revealed. I, I don't think there's really a solid way to do it for Halo yet. And that may just be one of the things where 343 needs to kind of go back to what Halo was and then start to introduce those things through the next few games at a slower pace than just kind of <clears throat> taking what Bungie did with Halo Reach and just completely running with it. That mm-hmm. kind of went in the opposite direction of what people were actually looking for. Yeah, they they either need to go back to their roots or they have to have like an original innovation in that regards. That's both interesting and captivating and like not offensive to players who, you know, like core halo, traditional halo. Well, and if you look at the kind of ways they can do that, the game types themselves of what they've introduced over the lifespan of halo is one of those things that gives that fresh new experience without, um, have in my personal opinion having to introduce those other gameplay elements in there i think those game types give a different life to halo and then of course the graphical upgrades the new maps and that kind of thing Mm -hmm. because is looking at call of duty the things that really change from game to game for call of duty is the perks the maps and just graphics update the gameplay mechanics haven't changed too significantly since Modern Warfare. Yeah, which to tie it into back into Titanfall, uh, the guys who who uh, started Respawn were the guys who were originally in charge at uh, Infinity War. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. Which, by by the way, there is a a lot in Titanfall that uh, feels like. Yeah, Call of Duty back when it just uh, what was it? Modern Warfare, I guess. Uh, yep. my, Modern Warfare Two per, was my uh, kind of introduction to Call mm-hmm. of Duty, but like, there's so many things in Titanfall that totally remind me of the days when, like, I I like literally seriously could not go to bed because I was busy like all night playing one yeah. last game of Modern Warfare 2. Uh, I don't remember where I was going with that, but uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I remember. It was just that uh, you know, like Call of Duty nowadays, yeah, it really hasn't, in a, like they added a dog to the last one uh, I think was the big change uh, yeah, that they and put a, in and Call a slide of Duty. mechanic and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um but uh yeah, I mean, I think though that with all of the all of this stuff, it really comes down to uh and I I really don't mean to make make this sound like uh as bad as it might towards 343, but like it, I think that Titanfall proves that like you need a good concept and you need good taste. Uh, and if the, if the development team has leaders in it that have just good taste in, in what they want, you know, in, in how they want to design a game, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, I feel like that's what Bungie, uh, had slash has, uh, you know, that clearly, uh, you know, these guys, uh, I, I really don't know their names and couldn't pick them out of a lineup but the the guys like you can just it feels like uh in certain ways like old modern warfare and modern warfare 2 uh and you know i i don't i don't know like i think those guys show that if you 
if you have great taste here, uh, then you know you can uh, you can evolve a uh, game I, like mechanic idea because uh, there's a lot that Titanfall has kind of brought to the table, but yet it still feels to me in in a lot of ways like the uh, the old Call of Duty stuff. I was trying to bring it back around to Titanfall. <laughs> <laughs> it's I personally haven't gotten like too much of a Call of Duty feel. I I do see elements from it, and I do recognize that a lot of people are saying they have the same kind of feeling. But if you look at what Titanfall has done, though, it really has defined a new experience for first person shooters with the wall running, the the Titans, just the way that the game flows, uh, all. All the stuff that they've added in there is a brand new, unique experience. Yep. And three for three has to find a way to kind of add their own flavor without messing up the balance of Halo and and bringing it back to to that balance, essentially. Yeah. Because this, I think most of the things that people have problem with with in Halo Four is how much of an imbalance things cause, and it's not to say that loadouts are the sole cause of it. There are plenty of other things, personal ordnance, the the kind of weapons that they have in there. Progression. Um, I put progression up there almost as high as the whole loadout thing. You know, because yeah, if, so if you look at like drive and incentive, yeah, I would I would agree with you and, and the whole ranking system as well. Yeah. But if you look at kind of the whole game of Titanfall versus um kind of a new experience for Halo, there's gotta be some new stuff that 343 can put in there to put their own twist on it, but they have to respect the roots of the game. Yeah, like, going back to that entire when Respawn was Infinity Ward point, like, when when they made Call of Duty 4, the huge innovation was, like, the entire like, back then, the huge innovation was that they had, like, the perk and class system. Like, that was a huge innovation at the time. If you go back to, like, COD 3 and then you look at how Call of Duty transformed to COD 4, that was the huge innovation. And then when they went to Modern Warfare 2, the huge innovation that they added to Call of Duty's formula was, um, like, pick your kill streaks and all these, you know, pretty much badass kill streaks that you could pick from. And, like, both of those innovations were ones that basically changed the landscape of first-person shooters for, the, like, the next couple of years. You see, like, game after game try to emulate those features, even Halo 4 to an extent with uh, the personal ordinances, uh, trying to emulate the killstreak feel, and then um, obviously loadouts with the classes. But um, going back to what you just said, Dustin, Halo kind of has to find that innovation they can make to the Halo formula that will enhance the Halo experience. Yeah, and I think just starting off with the game types is a good set for them because the game types that they've introduced are actually pretty cool. Yeah, extraction, like extraction. I love. Yeah, extraction yeah. is by far one of the best Halo game types ever. Like and ricochet. It's, yeah, ricochet is yeah. really cool. Especially like when, like if you if you were to think of a Halo game type before ricochet came out, like ricochet isn't something you would have ever thought you'd see in a Halo game. But that was something that they came up with. It was really cool. Everyone loved it, and that's just like one one like in terms of the bigger scale or like the grander scale of everything that was a small innovation that proves that like changing or like introducing something new isn't necessarily always bad you just have to do it in a way that complements and right sense in terms of the halo formula and a good way to think about that too is if if you can apply it to halo and it would you think it would work well in past halo games and it's a good addition yeah because I could see if it was available to play Ricochet or Extraction in Halo Three. Yeah, I think it'd it. Be, I think it'd be really cool. So yeah. you, you have to add on to the experience in such a way that complements the past Halo games and doesn't mm-hmm. really change the formula. And Halo Reach started to change that formula a little bit, and then Halo Four just kind of took it a, a big step further. And now they yeah. just need to take a, a big step back. And I mean, one of the things is we see a lot of people moving back to Halo Three, so it's it's there's a big swing back, which is a good indication that people want that kind of classic style of Halo Three there. I think at some 
point, Halo 3 outranked Halo 4 in terms of people playing on it. By far. For, like, like whenever yeah, when Halo 3 came out for uh, free. Yeah, when it was free, it, it was beating it that week, or like the next week. Yeah, I mean... And in, that should in, be a clear indication right there. Yeah. At like 3 o'clock in the morning one night, whenever, around the time uh, Halo 3 had come out uh, free, um, I saw over 30,000 people playing Halo 3 on like a Wednesday night at like 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> when was the last time you saw thirty, like over 30,000 people playing Halo 4? Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a long while. Um, <laughs> someone in the chat just mentioned uh, God of War is Garbo. He said, Legendary Slayer BR is the best settings because Halo takes skill. Uh, has more gun skill than any other games. Which is a good point to make because looking at the balance of the weapons uh, in previous Halo games, you started out with the same weapon with everyone. And you would yep. go out to find those power weapons and you would use your knowledge of the map and how people moved around the map and where to expect people to come from and where people are going to be to utilize those weapons. So it was a good combination of gun knowledge of being able and being able to use your weapon, which is where the skill gap got introduced, and then knowing the maps. So while Halo is simple at its core, it's very it, it's it has been very well balanced, and that skill gap makes it a lot more to to me enjoyable from the standpoint of you are drastically rewarded for doing well and when you get beat you're not sitting there just like sulking because you are good and you got beat by someone that's crap like you can do in halo 4 with personal loadouts you actually got beat because someone was better than you yep. and that that tends to drive people it, it does one of two things either it drives people to, to get better or it drives people away and it's like okay they're going to go play another game. But the people that really enjoy Halo are going to stick to Halo. And it's like, I want to get better. I want to get into that position where I can play well and play competitively with my friends. Yeah. And and have a good time. Yeah. And yes. that's, part of, and that's part of the stuff that's been lacking in Halo 4. And it's a lot of, of things that has really driven the community back to Halo 3 and driven the community to want a lot of these things changed for the next Halo. Yeah. I mean, Halo 3... Like there could, I don't think there could have been a better thing to happen to three four three in a long time than when Halo three went uh, free, because I think that it totally shows like wh you know if they were wondering like well where you know where are people's minds at now nowadays mm -hmm. you where's know where's the like, interest yeah yeah like it they I you know. If that didn't answer their question, then they're asking the wrong question. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I just I just go back to, you know, like like we were saying, the simplicity of everything. Yeah. Um, you're Halo needs to remember what Halo was or should be, uh, I guess. Um, and they. Uh, yeah. I mean, the talking about the it all comes down to the skill with the, with the weapons and picking up weapons on the map. Uh, you know, that, uh, that's a huge, that's a huge, uh, you know, part of what made halo halo. And, uh, you know, like I said, the whole, you know, minute to learn lifetime to master type of thing. It's, it was, uh, or it stands out to me in my mind from the games that I've played, at least that uh, any, you know, anybody really could sit down in front of a copy of Halo three or Halo two, you know, whatever. Uh, and you hand them a controller and you say, okay, here's how you jump and shoot and whatever. And the fact that there's, that's, all you have to worry, you know, worry about, like, I I feel like it has a, uh, what's the word, a, a potential entry point uh, to people, um, then uh, has a larger potential. What's the word I'm looking for? Does any, can anyone read my mind? I, I don't know. I'm not uh, exactly sure <laughs> to be honest. Uh, lower barrier to entry, I guess. Uh, for, yeah. For people who, you know, like, uh, it's, 
I don't know. I just old Halo to me was beautiful in yeah. in, the, in that way. You know, uh, I'll I've you know rambled it a few times, and I'll probably ramble on and say it a few more. But it's that simplicity. Uh, I, I don't know. To me, that's what I feel like uh, has been lacking in certainly in Halo Four. I feel like in Halo Reach, but uh, you know. Um, I'm, I just see someone in the chat here saying a uh, smaller learning curve. No, I'm not saying smaller learning curve. I'm saying that it is, it's has a lo- such a low barrier, barrier, to, uh, bleh, 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 barrier to entry than most other FPS games uh, that are out right now. But uh, just because it is simple, uh, that doesn't make it, you know, it doesn't mean that it's easy to win, I guess. Yeah. I, I, th- I think what you're going for is it's easy to get involved with the game, but it's harder to actually develop the skill and prove yourself as one of those top players. Yeah. That is uh, really deserving of that kind of position. And that's kind of where ranks in Halo 3 played a big part, was that you could see in real time how you ranked up with the people you were playing against. And you had that incentive to do well whenever you were going up against similarly ranked people, or when you weren't, like if you went to a party with someone and weren't as highly ranked as some of the other team, you knew why you weren't doing too well. And it's it's, it would cause you to want to get better. Yeah, and like one end... One indirect effect of like ranking systems and probably what I would consider the most important is when you're playing similarly ranked players, you're playing closer, more intense matches, yes. which may, which gets your adrenaline pumping. You know, you want to keep playing because it's a, it's a riveting experience as opposed to just playing, you know, like social matches where every match you either have a chance of getting absolutely stomped or you're stomping the other team and, you know, repeated play that's. Um, one of those two extremes isn't really as enticing as, you know, close heart racing, heart racing matches each time. Well, and that's one of the reasons why Halo is so much fun to watch. Yeah. It's because there are those constant close battles and the skills are so close where it is very engaging and so much fun to watch. Yep. Well, you know, old, I mean, look old... at, look at the people that attended the Halo 4 Global Championship oh and watched God. the stream. I mean, that stream was, through the roof in terms yeah. of people that were watching it. I mean, and it was it was a Halo phenomena. Yeah, like the, that finals, like my like I was getting shivers down my spine. I was shaking. Like I, I was like a nervous wreck watching that. And like I wasn't even I was watching, and that's just like and the, the finals of came Halo. down to a tie. Yeah, for crying out loud! Exactly. And then sudden death was first kill wins. A hundred or two hundred and fifty thousand or whatever it was, and that was just oh my god, that was crazy. I, w- I was sweating. It was cold sweat. Yeah, but that just goes to show how much because driving down into what was presented during Halo Four Global Championships, that was based off of a balanced playing field. Yeah. There weren't any free radicals out there. There weren't personal ordinances. It was all standardized across a common set of what was available for them to play on. And that's the kind of thing that needs to be brought back to Halo because that's the thing that really drives that fun competitive spirit that Halo has developed over the years. You know, old Halo is a sport, right? It's just like a, 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 you know, you go to watch a football game, uh, you know, both teams come to the field and before that game starts, they are both, they both have an equal chance to win or i guess another a better way to put it would be any advantage uh either team has is in the skill of those players yep you know it but like the wide receiver doesn't have uh you know the mod that'll let them you know have infinite sprint you know (laughs) and you know what i mean like yeah that's uh that's to me what always made halo more fun to watch uh, people play than you know any other you know first person shooter in my opinion you know it it's it's that you know it it really is a, a sport like it's set up like a sport yeah uh and yeah. the fact is that halo 4 was introduced in such a way that it was appealing more to the general gamer market than the core halo audience which is just 
unfortunate for the franchise. And that's where they have to really make a turnaround for Halo 5. Um, because one of the other things I wanted to bring up in Titanfall, and sorry we kind of just completely distract away from Titanfall, but one of the other things I wanted to bring up was how much of the fact that Titanfall, the popularity of it was driven by the community, almost solely by the community. Yeah, like... A lot of the hype, a large majority of the hype was built before any like piece of like commercial marketing was released. Like it was E3 that generated a ton of buzz. And then basically it was the beta where everyone got to like see for themselves. It was, you know, it was com- not, not completely, but largely driven, like you said, by the community. And that's something that Halo used to have in the past where. It was this game that you played overnight and you saw you had roommates coming into your college dorm rooms like, hey, what's this? And it's, you're sitting there. It's like, hey, it's Halo. Come and play. Yeah. I mean, and- if you think about how a majority of the Halo fan base got their start, that's how it was. It was, oh, come check out this game. It's really cool. It was a lot of fan driven promotion. Yeah. And it was like word of was- mouth. Like, yeah, and there was so much promotion pushed out from the developer for Halo 4 with not enough backing from the community and not enough involvement with the community to start out with that. It just flopped. Yeah. Well, I I, they, I think the community, and I, I'm saying this because I'm one of them, uh, but, they, you know, I early on, I feel like they um, really kind of uh, upset a lot of the community you know, with the changes that they said, you know, were going to be put in. Yeah, I remember, I don't remember which magazine it was, but it was like... Game Informer. Yeah, Game Informer, where they, like, first talked about specializations and things of that nature. Like, people really were worried. Like, a lot of people, like, at that point were saying, Halo 4 is done. Like, I'm not interested. I don't care. I know it's not going to be any good. It's not going to last for me. Like... like that just goes to show how much people don't want to play copies; they want to play originals. Yeah, alienated was the word I was looking for. Yeah, yeah, by the way. yeah. I mean, I was one of them. Uh, you know, I I can't tell you how many shows, uh, you know, we did back yeah. whenever that information first came out. That were just like, like maybe three episodes in a row. You could probably like just you know put it all together in one show because it was a it was basically like just three three episodes worth of me just <laughs> going just ripping uh yeah. you know all all this information apart uh yeah i mean you know so maybe that is what you know you were talking about dusty with uh the fact that 343 really you know pushed Halo 4 really quite a quite a bit but no community you know not the community involvement that we've seen in the past and I feel like they did a really good job at uh you know alienating the community even before this game ever came out yeah and it's just some of the things that needs to change to bring that back one of it's the beta the other is just kind of more openness with the community yeah. um but just looking at the gameplay, we've we've already discussed a lot of things that need to change um, and not trying to copy from other games' successes and coming up with your own unique play style and innovations to the franchise. Um, so that's just a lot of the th- things uh, from Titanfall that we can take from it. Uh, and there's some other things that we'll definitely talk about too uh, coming down in our future podcast, but... Uh, a couple other things I wanted to hit on that's not specifically um, game-related, but one is the special edition for Titanfall, uh, or at least the collector's edition. It had the gigantic Titan, mm-hmm. um, 18-inch statue, and I got it. It's it's It was all, worth the $250 I put towards it. <laughs> <laughs> what all did that uh, edition come with? So that came with the statue. It came with, with an art book. Uh, which is a lot of really cool stuff in there. It goes through some of the development stuff, some of the art boards, and a lot of cool behind the scenes and behind development stuff in that book. It's simply amazing. Uh, but those are really the only two special things that you got with it. But the the statue alone, the detail that they put into it was amazing. 
Yeah, and that art book, like I, I was looking at it uh, online, like at, at some scans, and it looked really cool. And I believe if you bought uh, the Titanfall art book alone, it was like a hundred dollars. So, I mean that that's a huge part of the value. Like that, a lot of the concept pieces I saw pulled from that art book just looked absolutely amazing, especially when in like. Uh, I believe the art book was the first time it was revealed like there would be like creatures or like monsters in the backdrop of maps, which was really cool to see at the time. Yeah, but uh, my, my personal favorite is the statue. I'm just going to put yeah, that yeah, out yeah. there. The statue I mean, the, the art book's great. It's one it, of a kind. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it comes with the statue and the art book? Yep. Yep. That's, and the yeah. game and the certificate of authenticity. <laughs> but uh, the other thing to it was it was a limited run it they only made i believe thirty thousand of these things dang yeah there, there's still some out there actually there's you can go on amazon and get them still but they're they only made thirty thousand of these um thirty thousand seems like a large number to me i don't know why but yeah i uh i really was heavily considering getting the special edition or yeah, whatever they called it limited edition whatever uh i just i'm not a big uh, art guy so the art book probably wouldn't have done a whole lot for me personally the statue looked kind of cool but like i don't know i'm i'm uh trying to de uh coll- i don't know i'm trying to get i'm trying to uh have some self control in all you know all this video game stuff yeah. you know like uh, there's you know i i have a couple um like you know, really expensive, like Star Wars helmets, you know, like I've got a Darth Vader one that is like a, uh, you know, an exact replica of what, you know, was in the movies and, Mm -hmm. you know, a clone trooper one that is really nice that I actually wore around in an airport, uh, which is a story for a different (laughs) different time. (laughs) And I was afraid to take the helmet off because then people would see my face. So I had no choice but to leave it on. Wow, but, that takes some dedication. Yeah, well, it, it was starting to get hot in there, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure it was. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know, then the Master Chief uh, Halo Three helmet. I don't, I don't know that I have a place for a statue. <laughs> I ended up just getting the digital version because I'm extremely lazy. Well, I got the collector's edition and I bought the digital version and gave the physical to someone else. <laughs> oh, nice. well, there you go. But. From the standpoint of the collector's edition, what I kind of wanted to address was the fact that Halo 4's limited edition was purely digital. Yeah. Yeah. And for a collector's edition, especially for Halo fans, something like that needs to be physical, like they did for Halo Reach and Halo 3. It needs yeah. to be something that you can really show off to people uh, that says you went out and bought this thing, not just the fact that you have a special in-game skin or you have access to all the maps, which is, it's nice to have those things in game. But for collectors, if you, if you make a collector's edition or a limited or legendary edition, you want that physical thing there. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the things that I think 343 needs to go back for Halo 5 and do is really look at the physical things they can put into a collector's edition and a legendary edition than just the digital and add that to it. Because with the whole move towards a digital marketplace, you kind of want those digital things in there, but you still want to reward those people with the physical assets. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Something that can exist outside the game that says, yes, this has meaning. Yep. I, I, could, I could not agree with you more. Uh, matter of fact, there uh, there was a whole... Um, episode that uh, me and my uh, my brother, my co-host, uh, I'm drunk in Halo. We did an entire show all about the uh, the first half was about how like how the lack of a legendary edition really didn't do them any favors, and then we we also went into uh, why uh, I feel like the Halo Three legendary edition was so badass and why the Halo Reach one sucked. <laughs> uh, but, I don't know, the um, Halo Reach one was cool because you got the you got Halsey's journal. Yeah, but you get that in the in the whatever the middle. Well, you get in the limited edition, but you still. Yeah. I mean, either one of those editions though, it's still something that's 
external to the game and it adds to the experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, the Hal- Halsey's Journal uh, m- was a work of pure genius. Uh, not, not, I'm not talking about Halsey personally. Uh, I'm just talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about uh, just the just everything about that was just unbelievably well done. Uh, there's there's no getting around that but but uh yeah like i'll be honest like i said i was seriously considering getting the uh limited edition or whatever of titanfall and one of the main reasons that i held off you know the were the things that i just said and also that there weren't any in-game things uh i'm a sucker for that um but yeah like they i i don't understand I don't understand the lack of an of a legendary edition of Halo Four, uh, and I uh, that was just the, that was just like one more thing that I, you know, I can't speak for the rest of the community, but me personally, uh, kind of put, you know, one more thing that kind of left a bad taste in my mouth, you know, yeah. by three, four, three, or whoever it was, who whoever's idea it was, uh, but yeah, so. That was, you know, the uh, limited edition or whatever was about two hundred fifty bucks, and it and it's worth it. I think it's worth it with the amount of detail that they put into that statue, and the whole fact that you can it has lights that you can turn on, and you can switch them. I thought that was a very good spending of two hundred fifty dollars. To be honest, <laughs> especially since it's like this is the first game of the franchise, like it just has that much more like yeah merit in my opinion. It's one of those things that really helps kind of reconfirm that it is possible to create a new, fresh experience in this industry, mm-hmm. and let alone in the first-person genre. Yeah, because you are you are you are going to have the rehashes of Call of Duty. You're going to have the rehashes of Battlefield. You're going to have the rehashes of Medal of Honor and Halo and all the other first-person shooter franchises out there. But the fact that a new studio can come in and create a new, fresh experience from the ground up and and basically say yes the genre is still alive and still innovative is a a very good thing for the genre but b it goes to serve that people need to step up their game and it's i mean we're talking halo here they need to step up their game in terms of innovating but also um be careful to make sure that your fans are satisfied as well because they they have they're in a tough spot I mean, they, I, I'm willing to give them a, a somewhat of a pre, free pass on Halo 4 because they were, this is technically their first game. I don't count CEA as their first game. Yeah, definitely. So they're, they're kind of getting acquainted to it, but you have to look at the ways that they can learn from the experience and, and take on a new role with the franchise and build it to where it's going to, resemble something that people want to play and that people will go out and talk, tell other people about. It's like, Hey, Halo's back. They did amazing things with it. Come play. Like that's what needs to happen. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, it kind of like goes to that saying, you know, like fool, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Shame on me. It's right. good. They're kind of like in that situation. Like they lost a lot of trust with the, the core audience and they kind of have to build that trust back and prove that you know their next title is going to be worth people's times right well and you know i think that um i don't know i think the the fight for uh the you know the uh trust of the halo community could very well be either won or lost uh before halo 5 even oh yeah definitely it's gonna out. it's gonna come down to you know what what they show and how how people perceive that to be reflective of the final product. Like well, I'm, if, I'm talking about uh, Halo Two Anniversary. Oh yeah, like you know it, ha, how how they are how they do that. You know if mm-hmm. if it's if it's just going to be a stupid map pack for Halo oh, Four. If, if it's a map pack, I like I'm I'm probably just I'm I'm probably done. Like I I would. That'd be so hard for me to stomach and just like look past. Like that'd be oh, that'd be such a blunder, especially with the fact that Halo Two. Okay, so like the thing with Halo CE's multiplayer was that it wasn't built for online play. Yeah, 
and that's why they just decided to go with a map pack. But well, this there was, time, there was that, and the fact that there was a still a sizable yeah, reach yeah, audience. Like, yeah, and then like right now, like Halo Four might as well, you know, it's like twenty fifteen to twenty thousand people left playing, and like it would just be it would be just as much work, if not more, to port over Halo Four to the Xbox One. And then to make the maps, remake the maps for Halo 4, than it would to just take Halo 2's, you know, already built in, built for, in like, um, Xbox Live Play, bring that to Halo 5 and just have that entire multiplayer experience. Like, if they were to go with a map pack, I'd honestly be mind blown. And I'd at, I don't know, I, I wouldn't be able to stomach that. I think I would just be done altogether, to be completely honest. Yeah. And that's one of the things that people worry about with this upcoming news of Halo. And I pr- I personally think whenever the leak came out from the one person saying that Halo 5 was going to be delayed for a year and Halo 2 Anniversary was coming out, I think a lot of people actually liked that news over seeing Halo 5 come out this year because yeah. it gives them oh. more dev time for Halo 5. It gives them time to nail down the experience and really go back to the fans and see what they want with the franchise while also providing an experience that a lot of people are going to hearken back to. And if they do it right in ter- in the terms of doing the multiplayer experience as kind of more of a um, copy modify instead of just mm-hmm. a map pack, then that's going to generate a lot of attention for the Halo franchise and start to bring a lot of people back. It's like, oh, Waypoint actually does know somewhat of what they're doing. Yeah, and it, it almost seems like too obvious to not do. Like, it, it almost seems like there's, like, no other way you... You announce and release Halo 2 Anniversary this year, and then your marketing for Halo 5 is we're back to classic Halo. You know, all of you that have brought back your interest because of our Halo 2 remake, here's Halo 5 that tries its best to bring back that Halo experience you all know and love and enjoyed with our Halo 2 Anniversary. Like, it, it seems so, so obvious and, like, such an easy way to build momentum leading into Halo 5 that... It, it would kind of like blow my mind if they didn't go any other way or like a similar direction. Yeah. I mean, just if not like everything you said, absolutely. Mm. Uh, but like just even, you know, dealing with the whole, you know, I don't think there's a lot of people right now who can honestly say that they absolutely trust or have faith in or however you want to phrase it. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, in three, four, three, uh, showing that, uh, they are, I hate to use the word competent cause that, that, that's yeah too low. Re- that really is too low of a word, but like the, just showing that they are possible to, you know, it's possible for them that to they're willing to put something out and that they're not just sitting there clueless. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, so, something to show that they're responsive to everyone's like, like well, that, verbal desire that they, you know, that they want they, these changes. Yeah, that they can at least recognize that. Like, all right, guys, we know, we know, Halo Four. Yeah, we know. Yeah, don't worry, <laughs> everything's okay. You know, like I know that. I know, one thing that really rubbed me the wrong way was have either of you guys watched the GDC? Uh, presentation from last year, I believe. Yeah, with the accessibility slide. Uh, yep, that's the one. Share picture. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and and not once like it was the post mortem, right? Mm-hmm. Not once like he he had a small a small part in his presentation where he talked about here's an example of something that we did right, and here's an example of something that we didn't. Uh, like. If this was a post mortem, like, you know, most of the stuff, I'm going to use the word stuff, I guess, because uh, <laughs> this isn't explicit, uh, had already gone down by that point. Uh, yeah. And I didn't really hear once the acknowledgement that, you know, we didn't, we, like, we dropped the ball or, you know, something equivalent. So, so like, what really rubs me the wrong way is the, I mean, if they've come out and said it, I, I haven't, I haven't. Uh, did you see Frankie's Christmas letter? No. It was, like, in a bulletin. He, like, yeah. acknowledged that they didn't do 
um I, I don't remember his exact words but it was basically like an apology or kind of an it was like an acknowledgement that there were shortcomings but like even i had issues with that because it's like one thing to like acknowledge it but it's like another to like demonstrate uh and show that you actually understand why people don't like it or why it was a mistake so like even even then like frankie's that letter what didn't really satisfy like what i was looking for out of 343 in that regard but i mean it was still a nice nice gesture i guess it's it's a funny game they have to play though to that point because it's the whole political game and yeah making sure that they they don't add fuel to the fire so it's almost like you want them to to come out and apologize but then what no, are the what are the backlash that they would get from that I yeah no I totally get I totally get what you're saying uh I think though uh like I, I mean there I mean Frankie all, all I want the, a good just... part of the studio is they're Halo fans so they they understand the ache that we have as Halo fans that of the way the game turned out so I have a f- I have a good suspicion that they probably feel similarly in one regards that they let down the community but you have to look at the flip side they made that game. They spent hours making that experience. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, 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 it's very hard for them to just come out and say, yes, this is wrong because it's something that they made and they spent so much time on and it's precious to them. So you, you kind of have to play a middle ground there. And I think that's kind of the best they, they could do mm-hmm. with given the fact that a, it is something that they kind of owe the community if they want to still be a successful studio, that they, they need that explanation out there and that acknowledgement. But B, it's still something that they slaved hours over. And that's something that we at least need to respect as fans. Oh, don't get, don't get me wrong. <laughs> uh, I've, I've had... Uh, I've had well, I'm, not uh, say, I'm not saying you're the one that doesn't, but there, are, there would be fans out there, and I know there are fans out there that uh, would just up and blame 343 for huh. absolutely ruining Halo. And yeah, when it comes I, down to it, it, it is, it's, a community, it's the community's game in certain regards, but it's also the studio's game in other regards as well. And that's just, yeah, it's a absolutely. delicate balance that you have to play back and forth. And they kind of have, have to answer to like, Microsoft executives. Yeah, I know they have a to lot, answer a lot micro- of, Mother Microsoft. Yeah, a lot of like the di- direction related things are handed down from Microsoft, and it's like up to 343's interpretation on how they satisfy like those directives. But yeah. Well, you know, the, I think the order that comes down from Microsoft is uh, put out a game that's going to make some money. Like, I don't think they're sitting there saying, oh, you know what, we need loadouts. Well, and whatever. the funny yeah. thing is, and the thing it, that it made me. money because of their of the way they marketed the game. A lot of people actually bought it, but it didn't hold people. Yeah. That was the yeah. thing. Like it, it was the most, it was the highest selling game of the franchise, but it retained the least amount of people. Yeah, and that's one thing that scares me. If like Microsoft looks at just the sales numbers and says, "Wow, Halo Four was a, a success. Whatever you did, keep doing it or do it more." Like if if that were to be the case, like. Oh man. Well, if that was the case, they it would not be successful for Halo 5 because they've already seen the community out, the outcry. Exactly. Yeah. Like that that trick can only work once. Exactly. But I just but, really hope like Microsoft understands like just just for like Halo's sake that there's more to it than just, you know, oh wow, Halo 4 sold the most in the franchise. Let's just all those things you guys did to the Halo formula keep keep going with it. Like I would I just pray that that's not the case. Yeah, and the, you know, the other thing I, to that is though Bungie had the freedom to make the game they wanted. Yeah, three four three doesn't quite have that freedom, which is something that I think if Microsoft were actually to let off on and let them be I, creative, I don't know. I completely I disagree with you. I think they made the game that they wanted to make with Halo Four, right? Mm, I mean, they had they had the. Uh, I'm sure there was some. People from the Microsoft corporate side of things is like, well, it's saying take what? take what? successful things from Call of Duty and implement it into the game. I don't. I I bet I, there was some kind of influence in that. I don't think. So. I, don't, I mean, maybe. Like, I mean, I. It's not like I ever. Like, I've never even been in Seattle. All right, so like, <laughs> you know, it's, I, I have no idea how it works. But I would. 
I just, I just have to imagine that the higher ups at Microsoft, they hire the heads of of the, uh, you know, these uh, studios to worry about all the minutia is. I think is you know you could say it, it would be they would call it because I mean you know what do they know about the video game industry nothing and that's okay they're you know they're Microsoft executives. Uh, but I, I just if, if say, you look I'm at the dynamic a- if you look at the dynamic that happened between Bungie and Microsoft though that wasn't a pleasant experience all the way through. They had to cut a lot of things that they wanted to implement into games because of timelines and because Microsoft said no you need to do this. And that was one of the reasons why Bungie got out. And then, isn't that also the reason why they like made ODST and Reach as opposed to like continuing the like main trilogy because they just wanted to get out of the contract. They 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 had to like fulfill the you have to make X amount of Halo games. I thought that yeah, I read I read that somewhere. Um Yeah, they they were slated for two more games after Halo three mm-hmm. uh on the contract. But Honestly, Halo 3 ODST was a fantastic game. Yeah, it's one oh, of yeah. my favorites. My, especially the, the campaign was... It's still my favorite Halo campaign to date. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And Halo uh, Reach, it, it wasn't necessarily a bad game. Yeah, no, I hold that game really close to my heart. Just because... I don't know. I think the, the campaign could have used a lot of work. Yeah. In my opinion. I, yeah. I personally but the multiplayer love... wasn't too bad. Yeah, I really... Except I for Armor Lock. Feel... <laughs> I feel kind of the the exact opposite. I really enjoyed the campaign uh in Halo Reach. Um mm-hmm. I uh I I I one thing that I just absolutely loved to death is the fact that there's no I almost I almost let it slip freaking flood uh in that <sighs> game. Uh and that's another you know, that's not the reason. It's one of the yeah. many reasons I loved uh ODST. Um but uh, you know the thing that Bungie's trying to do now with Destiny, where it's you know you create your own you know your own identity and you carry that with you mm-hmm. throughout the whole game. You know it's and you know I'd seen I've seen several other people say it, and I was I was thinking it to myself before I, I heard someone else say it. So you know uh, it's not exactly a, an an original thought, I guess, uh, but it was. I swear uh, that <laughs> that. You know, they did that in Reach. Like, that's what they did in Reach. Yeah. You know, you take your character with you. A persistent character, yeah. Yeah, and that, and I have to say, I really liked that. Yeah, same. Um, You know. It it felt like you were always building, you were building something, like, your, your, your character and, like, your, the progression of your character. It made you want to, you know, get to that, whatever, you know, rank, whatever, because you unlock the helmet that you really, really want. Exactly. You know, it makes you want it all the more, uh, because not only you know, not only is it, it carries just, over. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, that's like that's your guy, not your yeah. multiplayer guy. Like that's yeah. you. Yeah. No matter. Well, they what could you're do that doing. with Reach campaign because you were playing as a individual Spartan. You weren't playing as the Master Chief. True. No, I'm just saying things that I liked about Halo Reach. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. yeah, that that was one of the good things. But I think from a story perspective, on the reach camp and we'll get back on topic here in a second but from a, from a <laughs> story perspective it was it was not a story it wasn't story. true yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't and, true and yeah you know what That's that was a, that is a fantastic <laughs> way of saying it i guess uh yeah yeah i'm not it's not one of it's i don't hold it dearly because of the story i can tell you that yeah uh, of the more of the features yeah i just really enjoyed the like i really did not enjoy the just experience of Halo Reach multiplayer, but mm-hmm. I really feel like uh, the campaign. There was a lot of things that were enjoyable to me. Like uh, you know, I never had a problem with Bloom. I know a lot of other people did, but uh, I felt like Bloom really make made uh, my campaign experience. Uh, like I don't know. I felt like it added to it. I guess in a, in a weird way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, what was memorable for me for Reach and why I like hold it so dearly is when on three four three was kind of like when Bungie handed over basically the keys to Reach to three four three, and they they like brought all these 
interesting updates like um, the anniversary stuff and they implemented no bloom no sprint for the competitive crowd and they had that map pack and everything like it it like it it's kind of like what i want now is like they they like built up this faith and this trust that 343 was going to deliver on what we wanted out of halo and like i kind of like miss that feeling like i wish i could feel that way again about 343 so i guess that's why i hold it so dearly to my heart yeah i don't know i with the whole title update thing Mm-hmm. That 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 kind of rubbed me the wrong way too because they, really? they went yeah in in a weird way it did mm-hmm. I didn't have a problem with any of the changes I, I and I didn't have like the things that I didn't like about Reach was something that they could never really I guess fix in a title update um, I, I I didn't really enjoy this the slower pace of the game um, mm-hmm. but um, I guess some of that stuff could have. Uh, but the thing that I didn't like was that they, you know, were talking about it. I guess it was at Halo Fest. Uh, you know, and they were talking about the title update and all. Oh, it's going to be, you know, great. You know, Bungie never listened to you guys, but we're <laughs> listening to you. We're we're going to try to fix Bloom and all. It's, it, and then once they get the keys, is they? It's like they could never make a decision. It was like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, they did don't... kind of flip flop quite a bit. Uh, and and they just like, you know, they they go through this whole thing, you know, really pump up the title update, and then they, you know, oh well, we don't know what people want. Um, oh god. Oh, yeah, there geez. were four different flavors of Reach at any given yeah. time. That was yeah. a huge issue. There was like what Reach launched as, like kind of title updated, and then more title updated, and then like full out like no bloom, no sprint. Like it was, it was really overwhelming. Well, it, it, like I never, because I was a, also a huge fan of the uh, the Magnum in, in Reach. Mm-hmm. Um, that was probably my favorite weapon mm-hmm. in Reach. Uh, and you know, so like that was just kind of what I did at the beginning of every match was just switch to my Magnum if it wasn't <laughs> you know DMR. Uh, yeah. Start. I love that weapon. Yeah. And, but it was like I never had any idea what magnum i was switching to yeah i feel because you you know i had no idea if is this title update is it not is it no bloom is it you know and then the uh you know the cea map pack added Mm -hmm. yet another like another way to play yeah and yeah so that just for me personally uh that's that's about when when my yeah, I can uh, I can totally see that perspective. Yeah, but I mean, I I can understand it from yours too. I mean, mm-hmm. I you know having all that variety, uh, God damn, I miss that now. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and it was, it was like, I guess more for me since I'm more of like a competitive fan was like, like Reach was Reach was like the start of Halo, kind of dwindling in the competitive scene all the way down to like its state now, which is nothing less than basically dead um it, it, it like brought in all these like competitive friendly um updates and features and stuff like that and then what resulted was probably in my opinion one of the most fun like mlg halo events i've ever watched and like the the grand finals were amazing and i guess that's that's probably like the biggest reason why i hold reach so dearly but I can, I can see, like, on the other side of the coin, like, how, like, all those different experiences just, like, completely, I don't know, like, it's spread thin, the player the player population. Yeah. I mean, I, I know they, 343, talked about uh, not wanting to, uh, um, uh, what was Bring- the word they used? Whenever they brought up CEA, like the yeah. reason they didn't have a separate multiplayer, they didn't, they didn't want, want to split the community or yeah. the base, but they ended up doing it anyway. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, what was the result? Of it? it was like two different team slayers. Yeah. Or, or something similar to that. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know, in Reach, that was really all I mostly played. But mm. uh, so maybe it was just worse for someone like me who didn't really take advantage of uh, the multiple versions of i know i feel like on my computer sometimes when i go to uh right click on a file and 
it has open with sometimes i'll get like double entries in there Mm -hmm. like i'll have two (laughs) versions of logic or photoshop or whatever that's what i felt like going through the the playlist Mm -hmm. in in reach trying to pick something to play (sighs) that's an interesting analogy (laughs) uh a couple other things i wanted to kind of touch on before kind of wrapping this up uh titanfall launched with 15 maps which was amazing which is a very good mix or a very good number of maps too yeah um kind of copped out on the kind of copped out a little bit on the game types i think they could have done a little more there but just with the sheer amount of maps the halo 4 only had what nine ten maps to start off with something like that yeah it was it was it wasn't enough and like one one big part of like the entire map aspect of first person shooters is making sure like each map gets played an equal amount of time so like one of my yeah. biggest biggest complaints about reach in halo 4 is that it gives way too much say um or like way too much power to the players to pick what map they want to play like um titanfall just gives you a map says you're playing this map and it's completely randomized and you just play that map and then you play the next map and instead or like Halo 4 instead it's like all right am i playing Ragnarok or Ragnarok that this game or am i playing Haven like those were the two big maps that were just absolutely beaten to death within the first few months and it just like made me not want to play matchmaking because i didn't want to play those two maps over and over again but yeah. that does also serve to point out that the other maps that 343 made yeah. Either weren't they up didn't to have, par, or like that, up, or up to the level of those two, I guess. That or they didn't have enough support in terms of the game types, or true, yeah, or the support from a lot of people to go into those things. Because mm-hmm. I mean, if if you look at big team battle or big team slayer, it has a lot of the bigger maps, which those are played a lot in those playlists. And then you have the smaller maps that are played in a lot of the other playlists. Mm-hmm. So you have to just look at kind of how that really works out. Yeah. I I uh I actually <laughs> I don't I, I swear to god I'm not doing this on purpose. I I kind of feel like uh I kind of have to disagree a little bit in that I really like uh the maps in Halo 4 mm-hmm. uh, when compared to the Reach maps. Yeah. Um, I like uh it's I don't know. The, you're right in that the maps that that are in Halo Four they do get played over and over and over again. But I I, I feel like they're at least still you better know, than yeah. Yeah, like they're I at least good saying. maps. Yeah. You know, it, you just might get tired of playing them. Yeah. Uh, but like yeah, coming from uh Halo Reach, where again, just me personally, I I did, I could probably count on one hand the number of maps that I I. I really enjoyed in halo reach um but um uh, yeah my, one of my favorite maps actually though was from reach I, I i i cannot remember the name of it so i'm sure y'all love to hear about that but but yeah uh i i uh i have to say that i i really enjoy the maps in titanfall uh i feel like they've got a like one one thing that I I think really uh, makes a good map uh, or a good set of maps is each map has its own feel. You yes, know? like absolutely. And, it's like modern first person shooters. They like want to push this like gray and brown color scale on every map with like oh here's a destructed building next to some rocks and here's another destructed building next to some rocks. Here's a <laughs> cliffside. And, it, and it's like here's, Titanfall, a, here's, a, here's like an empty uh restaurant yeah exactly like, yeah. and then titanfall comes in is like here here's two nighttime maps here's one that's like a lagoon here's one that's you know uh corporate which is the one like set in the middle of a bunch of buildings like it's so refreshing game to game to play different styled maps both thematically and structure wise yes yep uh, absolutely yeah uh, I, I would I would almost say that um, the maps ha- like they they re- they nailed the feel of the maps in Titanfall 
the way that I feel that uh, Bungie nailed the feel of maps oh, yeah. Halo Three. Yeah. Um, because I know, like, for me personally, like, uh, the the maps in Halo Three that were that took place like in the desert. Uh, I, I sand I trap or sandbox or yeah, sand. Any trip. of them. Any yeah. of them. like uh, I I hate hot weather. Like, I, <laughs> and so like they uh they did such a good job at nailing the feel of being out in a desert with yeah. sand and just the sun beating down like i i didn't like to play on those maps uh, <laughs> because it made me feel hot like hot yeah wow yeah well that's awesome Bungie really got you on that one didn't they <laughs> they did but like and you live in texas I do, so I know no <laughs> hot. Uh, I, I refer to the level of hotness here as balls hot, uh, and that's pretty. I hot. Think that's yeah. adequately appropriate. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that's the same kind of. I don't know. I really feel like uh, they they nailed the the maps. Uh, I do have to say though, um, if I can mention something that I really dislike about Titanfall. Mm-hmm. Uh, what they call the campaign? Oh God, it's it's like, even though they came out and said, you know, we we're not emphasizing the story mode. We don't have a traditional story mode. I was like, okay, I'll lower my expectations. And then, for as low as my expectations were for the campaign mode, it still somehow managed to just fall so short of those expectations. Like tacking on like like a cutscene sometimes. <laughs> just a few, few audio pieces to match matchmaking matches was just i honestly thought it was like i thought i like i was playing a buggy version or like i was in a bugged lobby or something because like <laughs> those, those like audio those audio like, pieces that play when you're in the lobby they're yeah so, they're so like, jarring and they sound so low quality that i was just like is, is someone like playing something through their mic or something like, <laughs> what, what is this and then i realized it was the game trying to explain explain to me like why i was fighting in these areas and i was just like why just why <laughs> you know what you're absolutely right uh there especially towards the end of uh I, I i've only made it through the first uh campaign um i've only played like two games i just couldn't take it <laughs> oh but there's, a, there's a couple of those audio clips that play towards the end of the first campaign that like <laughs> totally sound at first totally sound like uh someone is in the lobby and yeah like there's a drunk you know kid singing or yeah uh, just whatever like they they talk like they're or they sound like they're talking through like a phone like back in the year like 2000 like (laughs) that's what it sounded like to me i was like what what is this it they hired bane's brother to be (laughs) and yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that, that was one of the things I was going to kind of just briefly mention. I didn't expect to do a full, full conversation <laughs> on it, but uh, from the campaign perspective, it, it definitely was a last minute yeah. thing that they kind of added in there. I wasn't expecting much, and um, it, it hit a little bit lower than my expectations too. Primarily because whenever they do explain some of the story that's going on in there, you're you're distracted most of the time because you're dealing with people chatting over the microphone or you're exactly. dealing with actual in-game battles. You don't have the chance to kind of sit back and take in the story. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I it's, mean it's it's nice to see that they put some kind of lore to the game and mm-hmm. do give some meaning to why Titans are fighting Titans and why you have these two different sides. I still but don't the, know. <laughs> the, <laughs> the the method of, of which they present that information though was not very well ironed out. And yeah. I kind of like so Minolta ten thirty four from Ready Up Live, he posted a video comparing Titanfall and Halo and uh he was very much disappointed with the campaign because he was very much hyped up about it from the ads that came out only three weeks before the game came out. That's probably um, when they started working on it. <laughs> very, very well might have been. But <laughs> to me, it was more an, an experience that I was expecting to be how Battlefield used to be, where Battlefield on the PC, at, when it was going before it really hit consoles, it was strictly a multiplayer experience. There was no campaign whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of what I was expecting Titanfall to be was this yeah. big multiplayer experience that was going to help define the next generation of pers- first, pers- first person shooter matchmaking on the console, which it does. 
Yeah. It does that very well with how it does in the multiplayer, but the campaign, the, the, the good things I take away from the campaign are its integration with matchmaking and giving some meaning to the story behind it, but they do a very poor job of actually presenting the story in a consumable format. Yeah. And giving you a platform of which to really experience the campaign. Cause you can't really go in on your own and do that without other people interfering. You have to go in in the matchmaking system and there's no local play either. Yeah. And which like, is, which is like all fine, but mm-hmm. just, and this kind of is one uh, thing that uh, reminded me of the old uh, modern warfare and modern warfare two campaigns that actually carried over to Titanfall that uh, was not good. Like, you know, something they should have, that's something they should have left behind, but was, you know, like the campaign story was told just mainly through people talking to you, Yeah, you know, like in modern warfare, uh, in modern warfare two, you know, it was cool. And, and all that, because it was like a, you know, a, you know, obviously a single player type thing. And so while the next, you know, mission was loading, they were talking to you and, you know, you, you don't mm-hmm. have that distraction of other people like, you know, in a lobby or whatever. So you actually almost, I mean, you can definitely uh, not pay attention to them talking, you know, while the mission's loading. But, you know, if, you know, odds are you kind of can't help but just listen to what they're saying. And so, like, I, you know, I uh, kind of, like, I understood what was going on for the most part in those games. Um but yeah, like the that's definitely a, you know, if you look at it, one of the uh, seems like hallmarks of, you know, an old Infinity Ward game, and, and I guess it, now a respawn game. Yeah, and I, I guess what upsets me, or like what upset me the most, was that like the entire premise of like there being those like huge dinosaur type beasts and like these flying beasts on the map. Like, there was, like, a lot of good, um, I don't even know how to explain it. Like, the, like the premise was there for, a, like, an interesting story, but, like, it failed to, like, explain, you know, why, why, why are these these dinosaur things? Like, I, like, had, like, this theory that, like, maybe they made Titans to fight off these beasts to survive, but then, like, you know, the militia got control of, like, Titan somehow and then that's how like war broke out or something like I, like my imagination went everywhere with like the entire premise of these like beasts and dinosaurs but then it was just it really wasn't like prevalent at all in the story mode from like the three missions I played so I kind of lost interest really quickly yeah I I, I don't think <laughs> I could be wrong I yeah. don't think they mentioned anything about that exactly and it's um, it's such a cool part because like you don't really see that in first person shooters is like like living interactive like animals or not even animal like beast types i don't even know what to call them but yeah it was just really cool and it was just really disappointing not to like have a reason or have a reason as to why they're there yeah other than just to have something on to a like, map yeah to like shoot commercials with or something you know yeah it's kind of it's kind of interesting that uh, you know there was a lot of talk about it being just a multiplayer game um, mm-hmm. when it you know and and that kind of caused uh, you know I don't want to say caused uh, any like trouble or whatever but there was definitely people who didn't yeah there's feel people great who, about that yeah people who want a story mode with like every basically every game they purchase. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like, like, I, I don't have a problem with it, though. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I see it as there, you know, there's tons of games out there that just are a, you know, a single player game yeah. and don't have any uh, multiplayer in it at all. And, you know, people Fallout. have. To, yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Fable. Well, mm, well not really. It does have co op, actually. Yeah. I never played it. But uh, like Skyrim, I understand. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know the uh, some of the Batman games, um, the Arkham games, I don't Lego think games. Most... Yeah, I mean, people like I, I thought it was funny when people were like, 
they shouldn't be charging 60 bucks for a game that's only got multiplayer. But, like, those same people will still go out and pay 60 bucks for a campaign experience. Yeah, I feel you. Uh, so, like, I don't have a problem with that at all. I just, I felt like, I don't know, I felt like it was kind of, you know, the campaign was, like, you know, it was hard to get through. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you really had to want to get through it. And that's just because you unlock more, you know. Uh, the Titan the, chest. Is yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So you're kind you're kind of you kind of have to but yeah. um like I don't know I I felt like it was a what would have been just an unbelievable statement to the entire gaming world yeah saying look 60 bucks for one of the most amazing multiplayer experiences you can possibly have and that's all it is and you know what you can buy it now or you can buy it later, but you're going to love it when you play it. Yeah. And you're yeah. not, you're not going to miss anything. I felt like it, like all that was kind of, uh, now it has like an asterisk. Next exactly. Year. Yeah. And like, it's such a horrible looking asterisk too. Like it, yeah. it's a, such a boring asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> like it's an asterisk that doesn't make sense. Yeah. And yeah. So I felt like that kind of, it was, it, you know, it's a, it's mean, like a small, it's it, not even small. It's a smudge on like an otherwise shining example of multiplayer can sell and captivate. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I, uh, I mean, to that point though, Xbox one sales went up almost a hundred percent Yeah, across that's all e- markets from Titanfall. That's, exactly. that's exactly what I was debating whether or not to, to bring up, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like, I uh, I have a PS4 as well, and like I thought that I would be playing that, you know, not more than my Xbox One, but so I thought I'd at least be playing it. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Both there's, consoles there's were like, pretty dry until Titanfall, basically. Exactly, like yeah. there, and I don't know what Sony really has coming that could possibly compete. Well, I think. Tomorrow is Infamous Second Son, which apparently, like, according to what I see on Twitter, is, like, getting mad amounts of hype, and a lot of people are anticipating it, but, yeah, like you said, other than that, I don't I don't know of any other titles other than, other than that that comes out relatively soon. Yeah, I mean, everything else that, that I can think of is, you know... Uh, Destiny, and that's, like, the only... Cross-platform, yeah, I mean... Yeah, yeah Destiny's I, the next big title. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I also think that if they can do um, if they can do Halo Two Anniversary right, mm-hmm. that uh, could be a console seller. Oh, that yeah, uh, that that I think that that could potentially. I mean, I don't think it's gonna like you know set any records or anything, but oh, I think yeah. that it could be big enough to really like. I think it it if they do it right, it, it'll be like the most underestimated game of the year oh for sure it, it like the impact a so, like the impact of a solid halo 2 anniversary the impact it could have not only by like like giving microsoft even more um i guess titles that it has um i guess as an advantage is, is it an advantage i don't know what the word i'm looking for but it's basically one more way microsoft can say, hey, we do this better than PS4, or we have this, they don't. But it also is like, it puts pressure on PS4. And like, even though like, I've played Microsoft consoles for so many years now exclusively, like I haven't touched a Sony console since like the PS2. Um, Competition is always good in the game industry because it forces people to innovate, which is always nice to see because I'd rather have two solid competing consoles and companies as opposed to like one dominating the other. Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. Uh, I, I'm going to be very interested to see the, um, total sales numbers of the PS4 and the Xbox one at the end of the year. Yeah. It'll be interesting for sure. Dustin, did you say, uh, how many, how many, uh, Xbox ones have, they sold because of uh, Titanfall. Uh, it was so far. it was about a hundred percent increase in the current sales. I don't know 
how that boils down numbers wise, but that's mm-hmm. that's still very significant in the fact that they it's sold as many title. consoles they had sold to date just because of one. They they doubled their selling because of one title. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. That is yeah. crazy. And I mean that's good to hear too because like, you know I'm I really don't have any uh, any like I I'm, I only play on an Xbox because that's where my friends are and that's yeah. where the games or really game that I like to play is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's uh, pretty much the case for a lot of people. Yeah, is really where their friends are. Yeah, exactly. I mean I'm an I'm an Apple guy, so like I really don't ha- you know have uh, you know I could really just leave microsoft behind and be okay uh Mm -hmm. so like i don't have any like uh attachment or anything like that to microsoft as a company uh actually it would be more the opposite if anything but (laughs) i like i uh i still though whenever i go to a store and i look and see what uh you know i i I, if a store i go to has a video game section i will always try to make my way over there just to see you know look and see what is there uh yeah. and it really was starting to feel uh dis- it was really disconcerting to see like just these stacks this- these mountains of xbox ones definitely just sitting there and then i'd go look at the ps4 stuff to see if they had any in stock not to buy but just you know see what they had yeah. and it it's always just like an empty, you know, an, <laughs> an empty, empty shelf. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I, I yeah went because to, the PS4s were just that much more popular than the Xbox. Yeah. Like I, I went to GameStop earlier today and like the Xbox one, like they have huge signs saying in stock buy your Xbox one today, like this and that. And then there's the PF, PS4 side of the store, which is like they have they, they don't have any PS4s in stock. Like the, the game stock is limited. And I was just like, wow. Like Sony really did a good job, like in this first, I guess this first part of the race that is the next generation of consoles. Well, and it's really going to turn out to be how it's going to what happens at the end of the year. Yeah, that's going to yeah, determine whether E3, Microsoft needs to change their game. Yeah, this E3 is going to be absolutely be huge. huge. Like, yeah, I know. Like every year, it's it's like tempting and easy to say this is going to be the biggest E3 yet, but. Honestly, like this E3, because like because the, of new consoles, exactly. The first wave of games on new consoles are always, you know, they're nice, but like they, they don't truly show what the like the next generation of consoles can do. It's always the, like the E3 after. Well, Titanfall's uh, done a pretty good job, I will say that. Yeah, much. yeah, Titanfall, Titanfall did amazing, but like this one, it's gonna be like Halo is gonna have so much stuff thrown at our face, and then PS4 is gonna have their answers to that and everything. And, We'll get a bunch of Destiny stuff. And it'll just be a great E3. What I feel like PS4, or from what I have, what I noticed is that Sony, with the both the Vita and the uh, PS4, and I guess the PS3 too. I, I guess uh, they seem like they're really focusing on uh, the whole indie game thing, mm-hmm. uh, which is really I, cool. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm not interested in any of it at all. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, at all, really. I mean, like, I, I, I paid for PS Plus and everything, but, like, I, I haven't really seen a game that uh, is, you know, free with PlayStation Plus or whatever that, like, I would really want to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I guess when I think about it, it, there's really not a lot with the games for gold or whatever that, yeah, games for gold is pretty. But they're yeah, they're kind of two different things though. In yeah. that games for gold are like games that were made when they were still trying to figure out how to get the most out of a Xbox 360. Yeah. You know, like where with PlayStation Plus, at least for the PlayStation 4 so far, it's all been like you know indie game mm-hmm. type types of you know like no first person anything. Yeah, uh, and, and that's you know, probably because like the back catalog, obviously, since the consoles are new, are pretty, pretty barren to pick from. But I mean, I think, I guess where I'm going with that is, I I think maybe, uh, I I think they might be kind of competing on two, you know, 
yeah, they're they're competing and selling consoles, but like I think that for, again, from what I've I've seen so far, mm-hmm. um, they're two totally different types of gamers that are uh, playing these you know these consoles. I mean, like again, I'm not a I don't really like mobile games. I don't really like indie games. Although I love the hell out of Journey. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't I don't know if you either of you played that, but I mean that. That's pretty good, but I mean, uh, I just think late in the PS3's life, Sony's had some real success with games like uh, Journey, um, you know, like really kind of fostering that indie developer com- community, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, they're, and they're really leveraging all that, uh, and you know, with the PS4 because there, you know, there's not a lot of AAA games coming out for it. I can tell you that. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a, always a, a sad, a sad scene whenever I go to look at the new releases for PS4, and there's like, you know, maybe two items on the list or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I think though that with uh, with games like Titanfall, with you know, again, if it's done right, what a what kind of uh, what a Halo 2 anniversary can do, um, not to mention all the, you know, uh, almost a journey, but destiny, uh, all that. I mean, I don't know. Do do either of you think that uh, at the end of the year, um, Microsoft could sell more consoles than Sony? Ooh. That's My the- gut reaction with just how things have started off yeah. With this console generation, it's going to be no, because Sony has so much leverage right now. Yeah, they've like their head start I, is. I just, mean, look, they're I out of they're stock like, everywhere. Yeah, they they are out of stock everywhere, and the price certainly doesn't help either. Uh, and I saw something like projections saying that, like the the demand is going to continue to exceed the supply for the rest of this year. When it comes to the PS4, they're gonna it's gonna remain like sold out throughout the year. Wow. Which is crazy. But it's, Microsoft did not market themselves well at all this year. Yeah, for sure. They 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 just had so many blunders and then they took a really long time to just kind of like bite the bullet and give people what they want, but then by then people had already made up their mind. But going back to your question, I think I still think the PS4 will outsell the Xbox One just merely because I have a feeling that the entire like Destiny timed exclusives with them getting the beta first and them getting like re- exclusive release content from what I remember is really going to help their sales because I like I personally haven't bought a PS4 yet but I'm I'm literally just waiting for the PS4 beta or PS4 Destiny beta just because they get it earlier and I'm that's like my only motivation right now to buy a PS4. So I don't know how big of a factor it is for other people, but I can imagine that it'd be for all the Bungie fans out there that it'd be pretty, it'd be a pretty big factor. Yeah, I, uh, I would say it would very much be, and I'm, I'm probably not going to be one that bites on the PS4 mm-hmm. for a while, even with Destiny. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, like, I'm really looking forward to it, but I, it's still coming to Xbox One. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing with like for me, and it sounds like you know first world problem type type yeah. thing. But, like, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You know, like uh, you know, I already have a PS4, so that's not a that's not an issue. Um, mm. You know, the issue for me is like, well, there's all the you know like the fact that you know with the PS4 it does have better graphics or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it you know does have um, the it, exclusives and all that but like all, all i literally have two people on my friends list and they live in like like london or wh- wherever that and so like i have never once played with them and, yeah. and i i've had a ps4s in like beginning of december uh yeah. and like i you know i want to play with my friends yeah that's a and, huge determining factor especially because you know it's so you know, Destiny is so like it's such a social, like integrated yeah, game. Like exactly, yeah. 
it's very friendly to cooperative play it, it's basically it encourages it almost requires cooperative play like that's how i'm getting like how fun it looks to be playing with like a dedicated group yeah yeah i mean and so yeah i don't i don't know i'm i, I would have to get i mean i I made two pre-orders for Destiny so I could get two codes, one for the <laughs> Xbox One and for the PS4. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that still going on? Is the pre-order and get the beta codes, have they stopped that yet? I think it's still going. I mean, they said it was limited, like they have a limited amount that they're aiming for, like a target number, but... It doesn't seem know. very limited right now. Yeah, it seems, <laughs> it seems unlimited. Yeah. Well, just a tip, I guess, then for all the listeners... Uh, what what I did is you go to Amazon, you pre-order it, they send you that code right away. You you uh, enter the code and and then just cancel your pre-order. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Deej even kind of hinted at that fact too. <laughs> <laughs> what did he oh. say about it? Uh, it was in one of their updates that he posted. Yeah. It's like, yeah, if if you want it, I'm just like I'm not technically supposed to say it, but it's out there. Yeah. <laughs> actually uh i'm thinking about it and i'm and i'm remembering now that uh i actually um pre-ordered two copies of the ps4 version because i originally had both of the xbox one pre-order and the ps4 pre-order in the same cart and then checked out and then they only sent me one code oh so i was like oh i was like man i almost did it again f it <laughs> uh i'll just uh <laughs> you know it's i'm I'll can- i'm gonna cancel this thing in like 15 minutes well, I, I had I just pre-ordered another PS4 version. I had the 360 pre-ordered when they initially announced it because they did, they only had the the last gen pre-orders up, not the next gen ones. Uh-huh. And then I canceled that one and pre-ordered the Xbox One version. So I technically have two codes. Oh, nice. Uh, and then if they come out with a collector's edition, I'll probably cancel and get that one. And if that's mm-hmm. announced before the beta comes out, then I'll have three codes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and th- and that's a you know uh, to be fair. That that is what I'm waiting on too. Like I'm just gonna wait to pre-order whatever the, you know. The, yeah, the nice special edition is. Yeah, the equivalent legendary edition. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's interesting though to I guess bring it back somewhat. Uh, the, you know, you got Titanfall on one hand, on one end of the spectrum. Uh, you know, really kind of set the bar. Not just for first person shooters but i think for what is considered like a good next gen game yeah and then you have destiny on the other end of the spectrum you know uh where it is you know it's a it's a it's still a multiplayer think about it multiplayer only game or intended to be at least you know mm-hmm. that you know intended that you would are going to play with your friends yeah but in a totally different way. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just interested to see uh, ha- which which end of that spectrum is going to work uh, better. Because mm-hmm. I'm, like, I'm really looking forward to Destiny. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, I think it's honestly going to... I mean, I, you could say the same about Titan, but I honestly think it's going to, like, blow people's minds and, like, change what people want out of shooters... It's it's going to be ridiculous, I think. I'm looking forward to it, but I'm still a little apprehensive about the whole story thing. I I like a little bit more info than what they're giving right now. Mm-hmm. And I maybe like... I've just been spoiled with having an established franchise, so I know kind of the backstory. Yeah. And they, they've let on... They haven't really let on in the past, like, what was coming in the story for Halo 2, Halo 3, and stuff. But... Maybe maybe I'm just apprehensive of the campaign experience, or well, really it's the whole experience because it revolves around the story of the traveler and um, the fallen, and then all the other races that are in there, and we don't really have much information on it. Yeah, I, I can completely understand. I think I, that's, I think that's on purpose, though, because the whole idea is you are going out and exploring and learning the story and that that's how the story is told is through your discovery of everything so i think there's only i mean i guess you could say that that's what every campaign is like but i think that you know this is a little different uh and i you know i uh, i think the but i'm I'm waiting for that one tidbit of information it's like 
this is the one thing, one part of the story that's going to make it interesting to me. And I haven't received yeah, it Yeah, like yet. the selling point. Really. Yeah, what's what's the selling point of the Destiny experience? Yeah. And, like, and I, I haven't gotten that yet. A huge part of it is I'm like 99% sure the game got pushed back because originally it was like beta was slated for like early 2014 and the release was supposed to be like either spring or summer of this year. But yeah, instead, it, it, it got, like, September 9th release, which, like, when that happened, they realized that the time between when they first revealed Destiny and the release date is really long. So they, like, have to really space out their reveals and stuff and have to only release so much information at certain points in time. But like you said, like, as of right now to, like, the large majority of people, it's it's hard to commit yourself to destiny without knowing exactly what it is yeah and i'm waiting for that one tidbit of information it's like here here is the selling point of the plot of destiny that's going yeah. to make you want to want play more it. Yeah. yeah exactly and i haven't gotten that yet yeah well or- i'm i'm convinced uh of destiny enough to uh have registered the domain um drunken destiny uh <laughs> Because, uh, you know, our show's Drunken Halo. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I'm I'm already, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I, I can't, I can't wait for Destiny. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. But, I mean, like, uh, what, what, uh, with Titanfall, the, the, uh, the whole multiplayer only thing. Do do you guys think the multiplayer, if like maybe someone listening is still kind of on the fence, would you guys say, uh, or if they're on the fence because of the no campaign thing? Because I didn't think that would be that big of a deal for people, but I've heard enough people like complain about that to where like, Mm -hmm. I I just, I don't know what people think anymore. Uh, Like, would, would you guys say that the multiplayer and titanfall is good enough to warrant 60 bucks i like i I was debating this with myself like for me it's not even like an issue of doesn't include single player but even like with the multiplayer stuff i i kept asking myself yeah like i assured myself yes titanfall is amazing it's good it's groundbreaking for the genre it's innovative it's everything but is the content that's offered at launch worth $60? And I don't know, it's hard to say with just five game modes and like a super lackluster and obviously campaign mode, but like with, with basically 15 maps, five game modes, really no no features, like there's no private match lobby, no theater, nothing like that. It's hard to say that like if you were to just look at the list of things that Titanfall has to offer, it'd be hard to say, wow, that's worth $60. But like, it's like, I don't think it's worth $60, but it's a must buy. So it's like, it's weird for me. It's like stuck. It's like both a must buy, but not worth the price take somehow. But I, I don't, it's you saying, really I, I get what you're saying there yeah. because are it you, is, it is something saying, that from a, from a multiplayer perspective offers a lot for the genre that it portrays the first person shooter genre but yeah you do bring up very good points the lackluster campaign the lack of additional game types and this private lob private lobbies but then again you don't have private lobbies in battlefield or call of duty well no you have to call of duty you don't have it in well, battlefield you, you have it in like battlefield does it in that like you just have an empty server and you like invite people and then close off the lobby but yeah, like it doesn't have like a traditional lobby system, but uh, Battlefield is a is a good example. Like a lot of people, I don't even know if a lot of people asked for it, but like Dice apparently thought that ha- tacking on a single player mode to Battlefield Four would sell more copies than just keeping it a multiplayer game. And what ended up was I played the Battlefield Four campaign, or at least tried to. I quit probably less than halfway through. It was so bad. And it almost like it was like I would have felt better paying sixty dollars just for the multiplayer of Battlefield Four than I would pay paying sixty dollars for that campaign that makes me feel bad about buying the game along with the multiplayer. Like it was, 
it was strange. But also that game was also riddled with a bunch of issues that still haven't been fixed to this day. But but yeah, I don't Battle... I don't have enough chance to play Battlefield Four. I mm-hmm. have it I have it for both the PS4 and Xbox One. It's like <laughs> and I've hardly played any of it. Um, I I honestly thought that when Battlefield Four worked for me, it was like by far the game of the year for me last year. It was so fun. It it honestly delivered on everything it said it would, at least for me. But like just the the bugs and the crashes just absolutely ruined that game for me. And the campaign was just awful. Well, Battlefield's never been known for campaign. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's that's like. I would have just paid sixty dollars for the multiplayer. I don't know why they bothered. So I so were you saying that with Titanfall, like on paper, it looked like it doesn't look like it would be worth sixty yeah, dollars, like, but like, like the after pl- like, but playing it, you you do you do or it's like not even that. It's just that like if, if if like a friend of mine or like anyone were to ask, hey, do you think Titanfall is worth sixty dollars? I would be like. Uh, no, because it, it only has five game modes. The story mode really isn't anything additional content-wise. It's just like a few cutscenes and some audio pieces. It's not worth $60. But then if a completely different friend were to like walk up to me and ask, hey, would you would you say that Titanfall is a must-buy? I would say yes. So it's like, I don't know how to explain it. It's, well, so it's like a double-edged there, sword. But, but here's a good question. Has there really been another game that has really sold on the multiplayer market outside of Xbox Live Arcade stuff. Other than like what do you mean? That's been almost just purely multiplayer. Well other than other than Battlefield probably not. So it's it's kinda hard to make the judgment on whether exactly. or not it's like hard to to Because there's lots of single players out there that you pay sixty bucks for and no one blinks an eye. Yeah. But it's for just something like, like this that's kind of uncharted territory. Yeah. It's yeah. hard to like compare it to something when you have no comparison to make. But well, that's that's why yeah, I was curious to get your guys' input on that. Yeah. It's 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 definitely one of those really shifty gray areas and it's gonna be something that will kind of be more defined, I think, throughout um Xbox One's history, because we'll see more and more games start to utilize this infrastructure that's been laid out, but <laughs> Uh, and then I wanted you, to ask you do bring guys, up an interesting question, though. I wanted yeah, to. I, I think it, uh, I just want to say I think it is worth it. Um, mm-hmm. The uh, I think you know the, but I I think that going off of what uh, you guys are saying, like uh, on paper, yeah, it it as you guys were listing off all that stuff, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah. Well, yeah. so the but fact. Like, the fact that after I played the alpha, it was enough for me to go out and buy the collector's edition, I think that says something. Yeah. And and that may just be me being crazy, but <laughs> so I it had... It could be that... both. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it could be. But I had that much fun with the Titanfall multiplayer experience that, for me, it was worth it in going out and getting the collector's edition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. the experience was... It was so refreshing, so vitalizing... It's revitalized and to... solid. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Minus and the few minor bugs, but they'll address those soon. I have, I personally have, can't think of any bug that I ran into other than the campaign. <laughs> There's one that came out today. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Do what? There's a burn card glitch. Really? Yeah. You get to like keep your burn card that like if you use a burn card that calls in a titan and then as it's like as you're spawning in the titan you switch to a different burn card you keep your the your burn card that calls in the titan but you use the the other one so you you basically get infinite titan call-ins from what i from what i learned from it pretty much yeah yeah am i the only one who likes being a pilot i I love it i like I'll, I'll sometimes, or like the majority of the time, I guess, I'll call in my Titan and just put it on like follow mode or guard mode, to be honest. I, I, I'm i in the Titan. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think because, I've actually... Because if someone's out of their Titan, it's on follow mode, I know they're close by, yeah. I know I can either crush them or shoot them. Yeah. And then take out their Titan. Is there a way to be able to tell if the Titan's in follow mode? Yeah. 
Whenever you, you look can... at it, it says autopilot. Uh, yeah. I haven't noticed that. <clears throat> um, yeah. But yeah, just uh, super quick. Yeah. the uh, If you're on the fence and you enjoy multiplayer uh, games, like if, if you're a campaign player, then yeah, this probably is not something for you. But if, you, uh, if you're into multiplayer uh, stuff, then like buy it like this. yeah it it will keep you uh glued to whatever you choose to play it on yeah definitely yeah and it yeah it <laughs> it's awesome it's very uh, awesome another funny thing about titanfall 2 this is the last thing i wanted to bring up was that it's running on a 10 year old source engine yeah which is crazy it like it's Oh it, and it gosh. looks freaking fantastic, yeah. but this is running on the Source engine. Yeah, the like, same look, engine that runs Half Life. Yeah, and like I look at Counter Strike Global Offensive, which just released like maybe like two or three years ago, and then I look at Titanfall. I'm just like, holy crap! Like, does that? That's ridiculously impressive. What? Well, however, whoever managed to do that at Respawn deserves like a raise five times over. Like, it's crazy. It's utterly amazing that yeah. this is run off of a 10 year old game engine yeah it's that's nuts i don't know anything about i don't know if that's props to the engine or props to the xbox or, or all of the above <laughs> but oh. that's that's just crazy yeah and i it also so here's something that i guess not many people have thought of if it's run off the source engine personal servers in an update for pc maybe yeah, I, that's one thing I wanted to ask you guys was, like, Titanfall is kind of like, it, it looks like it's going to follow this trend of, like, developers releasing games. Um, I guess, uh, I, Constant iteration. It's kind of like, it's like a stripped back version of a game. It, like, it's quote unquote unfinished. Obviously, it's like full released. It's, it went gold. It's released. But it's like quote unquote an unfinished game. And then the developer rolls out updates that, like, add content stuff like that like they've, the they've yeah they've, they've built like a, a good foundation or a good core yeah and then they start rolling out updates like it's it's like a rising trend especially with um pc titles like daisy and like rust and games like that like they'll release an alpha and then they'll update the game with content and stuff like that do you guys does that like type of i guess development model bother you guys at all does it like make it feel like the launch product isn't sufficient enough like what are you what are your thoughts on like that type of approach like releasing a game kind of like stripped back so that it can get to consumers quicker but then you're rolling out content updates after to kind of like fill out the fill out the rest of the game i think that uh if you're talking about like titanfall adding different game types or private lobbies yeah like, like that. i'm i'm cool with that uh i i'm i don't though think that uh going back to halo 4 super quickly i i don't think it's okay to like add the whole file share stuff and like that oh, yeah. uh to a game after it's out yeah. uh but but yeah i uh adding different game types or you know features like uh, the private lobbies and whatever like i'm Personally, I'm cool with that. As a matter of fact, I didn't even realize that it didn't, uh, or notice that uh, Titanfall didn't have private lobbies till one of you guys mentioned it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think as long as the core of the game is set, mm -hmm. then any additional things they add on, like game types and um, those kind of additional things that adds experience to it but not necessarily adds what would be considered required functionality i think that's fine there's yeah, it, definitely a lot of freedom with that to the to the developer yeah especially with like a, a new franchise yeah so it's almost like okay i expect i don't really have too many expectations for this franchise because it's new but it does give some longevity to the game and a manner of you always have something to come back to. Yeah. You always have some new fresh experience in, in which case can be very beneficial for a game and help. Exactly. Um, make the longevity. it longevity. Yeah. Make it last for much longer. 
So I'm not completely opposed against it, but you have to have a lot of that core functionality in there. Yeah. Yeah, and, you can't and, you can't be adding to the core three months down the line. Yeah, like the core. But you has can, to be but you can right. add. You can build something on on that. Yeah, you want to you want right. to supplement. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. So yeah. it that's last, all like. Yeah. Did you notice that the uh, season pass is like uh, almost suspiciously cheap? Yeah, it's like twenty five dollars or something. Yeah. Yeah. Which was really refreshing because I I didn't I have never bought a single season pass yet just because like a fifty or sixty dollar commitment to content I know nothing about just seems way too much of a risk and I'm glad I haven't taken that risk. Well, the War because... Games map pass was twenty five dollars. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. I got the limited edition, so it I came just... with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just. Yeah. Commitments to like content that I have I know nothing about other than the fact that it'll exist is kind of too risky for me. I feel the same way, but that ha- hasn't stopped me from doing yeah. it. <laughs> 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 it's like I hate myself while I'm yeah. um, confirming my credit card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was everything I kind of wanted to hit on the whole Titanfall and Halo stuff. All right, I'll whip out my list. We can no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are, three hours later. <laughs> but was there any bigger topics that you guys wanted to touch on before wrapping this up? I know we hit a lot of stuff, and I think we covered a good majority of it. Yeah, we covered uh, a really good amount. Yeah, I, I think to sum up, uh, to answer the 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 question of the big topic, yes, three four three can learn from this. <laughs> oh, 100 percent yes and they can learn a lot from this mm-hmm. so that wraps up a three-hour show i don't think we've had a show this long in over a year awesome. which, is, which is saying something yeah but i want to thank you guys uh justin bryce and apk for coming out and talking to us about titan fall thanks for having, having me having massive yes. good discussions uh, good discussions are what it's all about yeah, indeed it really is. Interesting. So, uh, everyone on the live stream, thank you for <laughs> staying with us for a long, <laughs> long time. You guys are awesome and you rock. For those listening to us via download or iTunes, you can find us on Twitch TV Thursday nights at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, which is when we do our live shows. You can come and join in on the conversations, chat with us during the stream, and... Just some really fun times in there, especially tonight. We had quite a few people. I think maybe at any one time uh, we maxed out at maybe 17, 18 viewers, which is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. But make sure you check that out if it's something that you have time for on Thursday nights. If not, you can download us regularly on iTunes or via RSS feed, or you can find us on our website, podtacular.com. And while you're over there, check out our Facebook page, our Twitter and YouTube and subscribe and follow all of those accounts and to contact us. If you want to comment on anything that we talked about tonight or any of our past shows, or you have a topic you want us to discuss or anything Halo related, feel free to send us an email submissions at podtacular.com, or you can go to our homepage and click on the submit your stuff button at the top. You can also call our listener voicemail two four zero two hundred halo and leave a message that way as well. Uh, keep it around 90 seconds for us, and we'll play it on an upcoming show. Um, make sure that you tune into or just check out our Wednesday night custom lobby. We call it Wacky Wednesdays. That is on Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time as well. We have a good list of customs that we go in and, and play, and we have a new group every week, it seems. And we don't exactly max out every time, but for the nights that we do, we have some pretty big team um customs that are a lot of fun so check those out if you are still into the halo gig and want to play with some uh cool people and play on some pretty awesome customs uh, you can check out uh our paypal donate we have that on the website kind of helps us with the hosting bills a little bit and we've also added a new amazon link uh we have a uh, partner link for you to go and buy some halo swag via amazon and we get a cut of that back so if you want to help us out while purchasing stuff from Amazon, you can use that link and uh, give us a little bit of assistance in paying bills and stuff. 
So that applies to anything on Amazon. Right. Yeah, and it like goes not to, not just the Halo. So as long as you click through one of the links up on the homepage and then navigate to anywhere else, like you can go ahead and add stuff to your cart and then come and click on the link and go to your cart, it'll still apply it to us. So that's how that works. It's really cool. And I stole that from Griffball Hub. So if you're listening, thank you for the idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a that's an old podcast trick. It goes back years. But yeah, it's it's actually a really good deal. We don't uh we don't do it because I'm lazy, but but yeah, I mean, it's uh, stuff you're going to buy from Amazon anyways. Exactly. It's not, it's not like you're paying any more. Right. And you would. And and you help give us a cut back and help support Podtacular. So a win-win right there for you. Uh, again, APK, Justin, thank you very much for coming on to the show for tonight. Uh, plug your Twitters, Facebooks, websites, whatever. <clears throat> All right, so on any of the sites, Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, you can just uh, add a Polish Korean to the end of the URL, and that'll be my my profile. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I am uh, excuse me, uh, at uh, jtpodcasts.com, uh, or just search iTunes for uh, Drunken Halo. And, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've got a Facebook page and a Twitter. Uh, Twitter is Drunken Halo. Uh, and I am uh, Justin Bryce, all in word uh, of Y, not an I in Bryce. Very is nice. The, is the Twitter drinking Halo two words? I don't even know. No, I think it's one. No, you can only. Yeah, there's no spaces. In yeah. Twitter. Okay. There you go. That's so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got Tweetbot on my phone and my computer. I see my actual, uh, my personal actual name. and the, oh, and yeah. the show uh, accounts. So little. There you go. Yep. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, Double so three. very well. That ends it for tonight, guys. Thank you for tuning into our three hour long podcast and until our next long one or just until our next show for next week. Uh, we will see you later. Keep on fragging those titans. <laughs> <laughs>